Act One of the Letter, a play in three acts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Letter, a play in three acts by W. Somerset Maugham. Characters Leslie Crosby, read by Jen Broda. Robert Crosby, read by Mark Leader. Howard Joyce, read by Beeswax Candle. Ong Chi Seng, read by Red Run. John Withers, read by Todd. Head Boy, read by Brian Fullen. Shung Ti, read by Brian Fullen. Dorothy Joyce, read by Annie Hendren. Mrs. Parker, read by Annie Hendren. A Sikh Sergeant of Police. Read by Brian Fullen. Jeffrey Hammond. Read by Bruce Kachuk. Narrated by Brian Fullen. Act One. The scene is the sitting room of the Crosby's bungalow. Along the whole back of the scene runs the veranda, which is approached by steps from the garden. The room is comfortably, but quite simply, furnished with rattan chairs, in which are cushions. There are tables with bowls of flowers on them and pieces of Malay silver. On the walls are watercolor pictures, and here and there an arrangement of creases and parangs. There are horns of sladang and a couple of tigers' heads. Rattan mats on the floor. On the cottage piano a piece of music stands open. The room is lit by one lamp, and this stands by a little table on which is Leslie's pillow lace. Another lamp hangs in the center of the veranda. When the curtain rises, the sound of a shot is heard, and a cry from Hammond. He is seen staggering towards the veranda. Leslie fires again. Oh, my God! He falls in a heap on the ground. Leslie follows him, firing, and then, standing over him, fires two or three more shots in rapid succession into the prostrate body. There is a little click as she mechanically pulls the trigger. The six chambers are empty. She looks at the revolver and lets it drop from her hand. Then her eyes fall on the body. They grow enormous, as though they would start out of her head, and a look of horror comes into her face. She gives a shudder as she looks at the dead man, and then, her gaze still fixed on the dreadful sight, backs into the room. There is an excited jabbering from the garden, and Leslie gives a start as she hears it. It is immediately followed by the appearance of the head boy and another, and then while they are speaking, two or three more appear. These are Chinese and wear white trousers and singlets. The others are Malays in sarongs. The head boy is a small, fat Chinaman of about forty. Missy, Missy, what's the matter? I hear gunfire. He catches sight of the body. Oh! The boy with him speaks to him excitedly in Chinese. Is he dead? Missy, Missy, who kill him? He bends over and looks at the corpse. Da, Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? The head boy kneels down and feels the man's face. The others stand round and chatter among themselves. Yes, I think him dead. Oh, my God. Head boy getting up. Missy, what for you do that? Do you know where the assistant district officer lives? Mr. Withers, Missy, yes, I savvy. He lives jolly long way from here. Fetch him. More better we wait till daylight, Missy. There's nothing to be frightened of. Hassan will drive you over in the car. Is Hassan there? Yes, Missy. He points to one of the melees. Wake Mr. Withers and tell him to come here at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. Go at once. The head boy turns to Hassan, the chauffeur, and gives him instructions in melee to get the car out. Hassan goes down the veranda steps. I think more better we bring body in, Missy, and put him on bed in spare room. No. No can leave him here, Missy. Don't touch it. When Mr. Withers comes, 
He'll say what's to be done. All right, Missy. I tell Ah Sing to wait here, maybe. If you like. I want Mr. Crosby sent for. Post office all closed up, Missy. No can telephone till tomorrow morning. What's the time? I think maybe twelve o'clock. You must wake the man up at the post office as you go through the village, and he must get on to Singapore somehow or the other, or try the police station. Perhaps they can get on. All right, Missy, I try. Give the man two or three dollars. Whatever happens, they must get on to him at once. If I catch you speak, uh, master, what thing I say, Missy? I'll write the message down for you. All right, Missy, you write. She sits down at a table and takes a sheet of paper and tries to write. Oh, my hand! I can't hold the pencil! She beats with her fist on the table in anger with herself and takes the pencil again. She writes a few words and then gets up, paper in hand. Here's the message. That's the telephone number. Master is spending the night at Mr. Joyce's house. I savvy the lawyer. They must ring and ring till they get an answer. They can give the message in Malay if they like. Read it and see if you understand. Yes, Missy, I understand. Leslie, reading. Come at once. There's been a terrible accident. Hammond is dead. All right, Missy. There is the sound of a car being started. There's the car. Be quick now. Yes, Missy. He goes out by the veranda. Leslie stands for a moment looking down at the floor. One or two melee women come softly up the steps. They look at the corpse and in whispers talk excitedly to one another. Leslie becomes conscious of their presence. What do you want? Go away, all of you. They fade away silently and only Ah Sing, a Chinese boy, is left. Leslie gives the body a long look. Then she goes into a room at the side, her own bedroom, and you hear the door locked. Ah Sing comes into the room, takes a cigarette out of a box on the table, and lights it. He sits down on the armchair, with one leg crossed over the other, and blows the smoke into the air. The curtain falls. There is an interval of one minute to mark the passing of three hours. The scene is the same as before. When the curtain rises, John Withers is walking up and down the room. The body has been removed. The head boy comes in. I believe I hear a motor car on road. Withers goes to the veranda and listens. I don't. I can't imagine why he's so long. There is the faint toot of a motor horn. Yes, by George, that's a car. Thank the Lord for that. John Withers is a young man, neatly dressed in a white duck suit. His topee is on a table. He goes to the door of Leslie's room and knocks. Mrs. Crosby? There is no answer, and he knocks again. Mrs. Crosby? Yes? There's a car on the road. That must be your husband. There is no reply to this. He listens for a moment, and then with a gesture of impatience, moves over to the veranda. The sound is heard of a motor arriving. It stops. Is that you, Crosby? Yes. Thank God. I thought you were never coming. Crosby comes up the veranda steps. He is a man of powerful build, forty years old, with a large, sunburned face. He is dressed in khaki shorts, a shirt without a tie, a khaki coat, and a broad-brimmed hat. Where's Leslie? She's in her room. She's locked herself in. She wouldn't see me till you came. What's happened? He goes to the door of Leslie's room and knocks urgently. Leslie! Leslie! There is a moment's pause. Joyce comes up the steps. He is a thin, spare, clean-shaven man of about five and forty. He wears ducks and a toppy. He holds out his hand to Withers. My name is Joyce. Are you the ADO? Yes, Withers. Crosby was spending the night with us. I thought I'd better come along with him. Leslie, it's me. Open the door. Withers to Joyce. Oh, are you the lawyer? Yes. 
Joyce and Simpson. Uh, I know. The door of Leslie's room is unlocked and slowly opened. She comes out and, closing it behind her, stands against it. Crosby stretching out his hands as though to take her in his arms. Leslie. Leslie warding him off with a gesture. Oh, don't touch me. What's happened? What's happened? Didn't they tell you over the telephone? They said Hammond was killed. Leslie looking towards the veranda. Is he there still? No, I had the body taken away. She looks at the three men with haggard eyes and then throws back her head. He tried to rape me, and I shot him. Leslie! My God! Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you've come. Darling, darling! She throws herself in his arms and he clasps her to his heart. Now at last she breaks down and sobs convulsively. Hold me tight. Don't let me go. I'm so frightened. Oh, Robert. Robert. It'll be all right. There's nothing to be frightened about. Don't let yourself go to pieces. I've got you, haven't I? Oh, Robert, what shall I do? I'm so unhappy. Sweetheart. Hold me close to you. Do you think you could tell us exactly what happened? Now? Come and sit down, dear heart. You're all in. He leads her to a chair and she sinks into it with exhaustion. I'm afraid it sounds awfully brutal, but my duty is... Oh, I know, of course. I'll tell you everything I can. I'll try to pull myself together. To Crosby. Give me your hanky. She takes a handkerchief out of his pocket and dries her eyes. Don't hurry yourself, darling. Take your time. Leslie forcing a smile to her lips. It's so good to have you here. It's lucky Howard came along. Oh, Mr. Joyce, how nice of you. She stretches out her hand. Fancy you're coming all this way at this time of night. Yeah, that's all right. How's Dorothy? Oh, she's very well, thank you. I feel so dreadfully faint. Would you like a drop of whiskey? Leslie closing her eyes. It's on the table. Crosby goes and mixes her a small whiskey and seltzer. She is lying on a long chair with her eyes closed, her face pale and wan. Joyce in an undertone to Withers. How long have you been here? Oh, an hour or more. I was fast asleep. My boy woke me up and said the Crosby's head boy was there and wanted to see me at once. Yes. Of course, I jumped up. He was on the veranda. He told me Hammond had been shot and asked me to come at once. Did he tell you she'd shot him? Yes. When I got here, Mrs. Crosby had locked herself in her room and refused to come out till her husband came. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. Oh. Withers taking it out of his pocket. Here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Leslie slowly opens her eyes and looks at the two men talking. Joyce takes the revolver in his hands and looks at it. Joyce to Crosby as he comes across the room with the whiskey. Is this yours, Bob? Yes. He goes up to Leslie and supports her while she sips. Have you questioned the boys? Yes, they know nothing. They were asleep in their own quarters. They were awakened by the firing, and when they came here, they found Hammond lying on the floor. Where exactly? Withers pointing. There. On the veranda under the lamp. Thank you. I shall feel better in a minute. I'm sorry to be so tiresome. Do you feel well enough to talk now? I think so. You needn't be in such a devil of a hurry. She's in no condition to make a long statement now. It'll have to be made sooner or later. It's all right, Robert, really. I feel perfectly well now. I think we ought to be put in possession of the facts as soon as possible. Take your time, Mrs. Crosby. After all, we're all friends here. What do you want me to do? 
If you've got any questions to ask, I'll do my best to answer them. Perhaps it would be better if you told us the whole story in your own way. Do you think you can manage that? I'll try. She gets up from the long chair. What do you want to do? I want to sit upright. She sits down and for a moment hesitates. Crosby and Withers are standing up. Joyce is seated opposite to her. The eyes of all of them are on her face, addressing Withers. Robert was spending the night in Singapore, you know. Yes, your boy told me that. I was going in with him, but I wasn't feeling very well, and I thought I'd stay here. I never mind being alone. With a half-smile at Crosby. A planter's wife gets used to that, you know. That's true. I had dinner rather late, and then I started working on my lace. She points to the pillow on which a piece of lace half-made is pinned with little pins. My wife is rather adept at lace-making. Yes, I know. I've heard that. I don't know how long I'd been working. It fascinates me, you know, and I lose all sense of time. Suddenly I heard a footstep outside, and someone came up the steps of the veranda and said, Good evening. Can I come in? I was startled, because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Hammond left his car about a quarter of a mile down the road. It's parked under the trees. Your chauffeur noticed it as we were driving back. I wonder why Hammond left his car there. Presumably, he did not want anyone to hear him drive up. Go on, Mrs. Crosby. At first I couldn't see who it was. I work in spectacles, you know, and in the half-darkness of the veranda, it was impossible for me to recognize anybody. Who is it? I said. Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, come in and have a drink, I said, and I took off my spectacles. I got up and shook hands with him. Were you surprised to see him? I was, rather. He hadn't been up to the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months at least, I should think. I told him Robert was away. He'd had to go to Singapore on business. What did he say to that? He said, Oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come along and see how you were getting on. I asked him how he'd come, as I hadn't heard a car, and he said he'd left it on the road because he thought we might be in bed and asleep, and he didn't want to wake us up. I see. As Robert was away, there wasn't any whiskey in the room, but I thought the boys would be asleep, so I didn't call them. I just went and fetched it myself. Hammond mixed himself a drink and lit his pipe. Was he quite sober? I never thought about it. I suppose he had been drinking, but just then it didn't occur to me. What happened? Well, nothing very much. I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another. He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. It had killed a couple of goats, and the villagers were in a state about it. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it at Tiffin yesterday? Did you? I believe you did. Fire away, Mrs. Crosby. Well, we were just chatting. Then suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said. He said, I don't know how you can bear to disfigure yourself with those horrible spectacles. You've got very pretty eyes indeed, you know, and it's too bad of you to hide them. Had he ever said anything of the sort to you before? No, never. I was a little taken aback, but I thought it best to take it quite lightly. I make no pretensions to being a raving beauty, you know, I said. But you are, he said. It sounds awfully silly to repeat things like this. Never mind. Please let us have his exact words. Well, he said, It's too bad of you to try to make yourself look plain, but thank God you don't succeed. She gives the two strangers a jointly deprecating look, 
I shrugged my shoulders. I thought it rather impertinent of him to talk to me like that. I don't wonder. Did you say anything? Yes, I said. If you ask me point blank, I'm bound to tell you that I don't care a row of pins what you think about me. I was trying to snub him, but he only laughed. I'm going to tell you all the same, he said. I think you're the prettiest thing I've seen for many a long year. Sweet of you, I said. But in that case, I can only think of you half-witted. He laughed again. He'd been sitting over there, and he got up and drew up a chair near the table I was working at. You're not going to have the face to deny that you have the prettiest hands in the world, he said. That rather put my back up. In point of fact, my hands are not very good, and I just as soon people didn't talk about them. It's only an awful fool of a woman who wants to be flattered on her worst points. Leslie, darling. He takes one of her hands and kisses it. Oh, Robert, you silly old thing. Well, uh, when Hammond was talking in that strain, did he just sit still with his arms crossed? Oh, no. He tried to take one of my hands, but I gave him a little tap. I wasn't particularly annoyed. I merely thought he was rather silly. I said to him, Don't be an idiot. Sit down where you were before and talk sensibly, or else I shall send you home. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't kick him out there and then. I didn't want to make a fuss. You know, there are men who think it's their duty to flirt with a woman when they get the chance. I believe they think women expect it of them. And for all I know, a good many do. But I'm not one of them. Am I, Robert? Far from it. A woman only makes a perfect fool of herself if she makes a scene every time a man pays her one or two compliments. She doesn't need much experience of the world to discover that it means rather less than nothing. I didn't suspect for an instant that Hammond was serious. When did you suspect? Then, what he said next. You see, he didn't move. He just looked at me straight in the face and said... Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? The cad. I don't, I answered. You see, it meant so little to me that I hadn't the smallest difficulty in keeping perfectly cool. I don't believe it for a minute, I said. And even if it were true, I don't want you to say it. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Why, we've known him for seven years. Robert? Yes, he came here after the war. And he's never paid me the smallest attention. I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. If you'd asked me, I should have said I didn't begin to exist for him. Crosby to Joyce. You must remember that we never saw very much of him. When he first came here, he was ill, and I got Robert to go over and fetch him. He was all alone in his bungalow. Where was his bungalow? About six or seven miles from here. I couldn't bear the idea of his lying there without anyone to look after him. And so we brought him here and took care of him till he was fit again. We saw a certain amount of him after that. But we had nothing much in common, and we never became very intimate. For the last two or three years, we've hardly seen him at all. To tell you the truth, after all that Leslie has done for him when he was ill... I thought he was almost too casual. He used to come over now and then to play tennis, and we used to meet him at other people's houses now and again, but I don't think I'd set eyes on him for a month. I see. He helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking. Anyhow, I thought he'd had enough. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. I was quite friendly about it. I wasn't the least frightened or anything like that. It never occurred to me that I couldn't manage him. He didn't pay any attention to what I said. He emptied his glass and put it down. Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? He asked in a funny, abrupt way. That's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? I said. It's awful having to tell you this. I'm so ashamed. It's so disgraceful. I know it's hard. 
But for your own sake, I beg you to tell us the whole story now. If Mrs. Crosby would like to wait a little, I don't see any great harm in that. No, if I've got to tell it, I'll tell it now. What's the good of waiting? My head's simply throbbing. Don't be too hard on her, Howard. He's being as kind as he can be. I hope so. That's the most obvious explanation, you said. Well, it's a lie, he said. I've loved you ever since I first knew you. I've held my tongue as long as I could, and now it's got to come out. I love you. I love you. I love you. He repeated it just like that. Crosby between his teeth. The swine. Leslie rising from her seat and standing. I got up and I put away the pillow with my lace. I held out my hand. Good night, I said. He didn't take it. He just stood and looked at me, and his eyes were all funny. I'm not going now, he said. Then I began to lose my temper. I think I'd kept it too long. I think I'm a very even-tempered woman. But when I'm roused, I don't care very much what I say. But you poor fool, I cried at him. Don't you know that I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. What do I care, he said. Robert's away. The cur, the filthy cur, oh my God. Be quiet, Bob. That was the last straw. I was beside myself. Even then I wasn't frightened. It never occurred to me he'd dare. He'd dare. I was just angry. I thought he was just a filthy swine to talk to me like that, because he knew Robert was safely out of the way. If you don't go away this minute, I said, I shall call the boys and have you thrown out. He gave a filthy look. They're out of earshot, he said. I walked past him quickly. I wanted to get out on the veranda so I could give the boys a call. I knew they'd hear me from there, but he took hold of my arm and swung me back. Let me go, I screamed. I was furious. Not much, he said. Not much. I've got you now. I opened my mouth and I shouted as loud as I could. Boy, boy. But he put his hand over it. Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. It's asking too much of me. It's so shameful. Shameful. Oh, Leslie, my darling, I wish to God I'd never left you. Oh, it was awful. She sobs brokenheartedly. I beseech you to control yourself. You've been wonderful up till now. I know it's very hard, but you must tell us everything. I didn't know what he was doing. He flung his arms around me. He began to kiss me. I struggled. His lips were burning, and I turned my mouth away. No, 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 I screamed. Leave me alone. I won't. I began to cry. I tried to tear myself away from him. He seemed like a madman. I can't bear much more of this. Be quiet, Bob. I don't know what happened. I was all confused. I was so frightened. He seemed to be talking. Talking. He kept on saying that he loved me and wanted me. Oh, the misery. He held me so tight that I couldn't move. I never knew how strong he was. I felt as weak as a rat. It was awful to feel so helpless. I'm trying to tell you everything, but it's all in a blur. I felt myself growing weaker and weaker, and I thought I'd faint. His breath was hot on my face, and it made me feel desperately sick. The brute. He kissed me. He kissed my neck. Oh, the horror. And he held me so tight that I felt I couldn't breathe. Then he lifted me right off my feet. I tried to kick him. He only held me tighter. Then I felt he was carrying me. He didn't say anything. I didn't look at him, but somehow I saw his face, and it was as white as a sheet, and his eyes were burning. He wasn't a man anymore. He was a savage. 
I felt my heart pounding against my ribs. Don't look at me. I don't want any of you to look at me. It flashed across me that he was carrying me to the bedroom. Oh. If he weren't dead, I'd strangle him with my own hands. It all happened in a moment. He stumbled and fell. I don't know why. I don't know if he caught his foot in something or if it was just an accident. I fell with him. It gave me a chance. Somehow his hold on me loosened and I snatched myself away from him. It was all instinctive. It was the affair of a moment. I didn't know what I was doing. I jumped up and I ran around the sofa. He was a little slow at getting up. He had a game leg. Yes, he had his kneecap smashed in the wall. Then he made a dash at me. There was a revolver on the table, and I snatched it. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report. I saw him stagger. He cried out. He said something. I don't know what it was. I was beside myself. I was in a frenzy. He lurched out of the room onto the veranda, and I followed him. I don't remember anything. I heard the reports one after the other. I don't ask you to believe me, but I didn't even know I was pulling the trigger. I saw Hammond fall down. Suddenly I heard a funny little click, and it flashed through my mind that I'd fired all the cartridges and the revolver was empty. It was only then that I knew what I'd done. It was as if scales dropped from my eyes, and all at once I caught sight of Hammond, and he was lying there in a heap. Crosby taking her in his arms. My poor child. Oh, Robert, what have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths of them wouldn't have had the nerve. How did the revolver happen to be there? I don't very often leave Leslie alone for the night, but when I do I feel safer if she's got a weapon handy. I saw that all the barrels were loaded before I left, and thank God I did. That's all, Mr. Withers. You must forgive me if I wouldn't see you when you came, but I wanted my husband. Of course. May I say that I think you behaved magnificently. I'm fearfully sorry we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. But I think Mr. Joyce was right. It was much better that we should be in possession of all the facts immediately. Oh, I know. It's quite obvious the man was drunk, and he only got what he deserved. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. It's so awful to think that I killed him. It was an easy death for him. By God, if ever I've wanted to torture anyone. No, don't, Robert, don't. The man's dead. Could I see the body for a minute? Yes, I'll take you to where it is. Leslie with a little shudder. You don't want me to come? No, of course not. You stay here with Bob. We should only be a minute. Joyce and Withers go out. I am so tired. I am so desperately tired. I know you are, darling. I'll do anything to help you. There doesn't seem to be a thing I can do. You can love me. I've always loved you with all my heart. Yes, but now... If I could love you any more, I would now. You don't blame me? Blame you? I think you've been splendid. By God... You're a plucky little woman. This is going to give you an awful lot of anxiety, my dear. Don't think about me. I don't matter. Only think about yourself. What will they do to me? Do? I'd like to see anyone talk of doing anything to you. Why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. I so hate the idea of everyone talking about me. I know, darling. Whatever people say, you'll never believe anything against me, will you? Of course not. What should they say? How can I tell? People are so unkind. They might easily say that he would never have made advances to me if I hadn't led him on. 
I think that's the last thing anyone who's ever seen you would dream of saying. Do you love me very much, Robert? I can never tell you how much. We have been happy together all these years, haven't we? By George, yes. We've been married for ten years, and it hardly seems a day. Do you know that we've never even had a quarrel? Leslie with a smile. Who could quarrel with anyone as kind and as good-natured as you are? You know, Leslie, it makes me feel stupid and awkward to say some things. I'm not one of those fellows with the gift of the gab, but I do want you to know how awfully grateful I am to you for all you've done for me. Oh, my dear, what are you talking about? You see, I'm not in the least clever, and I'm a great, ugly, hulking devil. I'm not fit to clean your boots, really. I never knew at the beginning why you ever thought of me. You've been the best wife a man ever had. Oh, what nonsense. Oh, no, it isn't. Because I don't say much, you mustn't fancy I don't think a lot. I don't know how I've deserved all the luck I've had. Darling, it's so good to hear you say that. He takes her in his arms and lingeringly kisses her mouth. Joyce and Withers return. Without self-consciousness, Leslie releases herself from her husband's embrace and turns to the two men. Wouldn't you like something to eat? You must be perfectly ravenous. Oh, no. Don't bother, Mrs. Crosby. It's no bother at all. I expect the boys are still about. And if they're not, I can easily make you a little something myself on the chafing dish. Personally, I'm not at all hungry. Robert? No, dear. In point of fact, I think it's about time we started for Singapore. Leslie, a trifle startled. Now? It'll be dawn when we get there. By the time you've had a bath and some breakfast, it'll be eight o'clock. We'll ring up the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. Don't you think that's the best thing we can do, with us? Yes, I suppose so. You'll come with us, of course. I think I'd better, don't you? Shall I be arrested? Joyce with a glance at Withers. I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Mr. Joyce's idea is that you should go to the Attorney General and give yourself up. Of course, all this is entirely out of my line. I don't exactly know what I ought to do. Poor Mr. Withers. I'm so sorry to give you all this trouble. Oh, don't bother about me. The worst that can happen to me is that I shall get hauled over the coals for doing the wrong thing. Leslie with a faint smile. And you've lost a good night's rest, too. Well, we'll start when you're ready, my dear. Shall I be imprisoned? That is for the Attorney General to decide. I hope that after you've told him your story, we shall be able to get him to accept bail. It depends on what the charge is. He's a very good fellow. I'm sure he'll do everything he can. He must do his duty. What do you mean by that? I think it not unlikely that he'll say any one charge is possible. And in that case, I'm afraid that an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. There is a moment's pause. The only sign that Leslie gives that the word startles her is the clenching of one of her hands. But it requires quite an effort for her to keep her voice level and calm. I'll just go and change into a jumper. I won't be a minute. And I'll get a hat. Oh, very well. You'd better go and give her a hand, Bob. She'll want someone to do her up. Oh, no, don't bother. I can manage quite well by myself. A jumper doesn't have to be done up, my poor friend. Doesn't it? I forgot. I think you'd better go along all the same, old man. I'm not thinking of committing suicide, you know. I should hope not. The idea never occurred to me. I thought I'd like to have a word or two with Withers. Come along, Robert. They go into her bedroom, leaving the door open. Joyce goes over and closes it. By George, that woman's a marvel. In what way? I never saw anyone so calm in my life. Her self-control is absolutely amazing. 
She must have a nerve of iron. She has a great deal more character than I ever suspected. You've known her a good many years, haven't you? Never since she married Crosby. He's my oldest pal in the colony. But I've never known her very well. She hardly ever came into Singapore. Always found her very reserved, and I suppose she was shy. But my wife has been down here a good deal, and she raves about her. She says that when you really get to know her, she's a very nice woman. Of course she's a very nice woman. She's certainly a very pretty one. I was very much impressed by the way in which she told that terrible story. I wish she could have been a little more explicit here and there. It was rather confused towards the end. My dear fellow, what do you expect? You could see that she was just holding on to herself like grim death. It seemed to me a marvel that she was so coherent. I say, what a swine that man was. By the way, did you know Hammond? Yes, I knew him a little. I've only been here three months, you know. Is this your first job as ADO? Yes. Was Hammond a heavy drinker? I don't know that he was. He could take his whack, but I never saw him actually drunk. Of course I've heard of him, but I never met him myself. He was by way of being rather a favourite with the ladies, wasn't he? He was a very good-looking chap. You know the sort. Very breezy and devil-may-care and generous with his money. Yes, that is the sort they fall for. I've always understood he was one of the most popular men in the colony. Before he hurt his leg in the war, he held a tennis championship, and I believe he had the reputation of being the best dancer between Penang and Singapore. Did you like him? He was the sort of chap you couldn't help liking. I should have said he was a man who hadn't an enemy in the world. Was he the sort of chap you'd expect to do a thing like this? Uh, how should I know? How can you tell what a man will do when he's drunk? My own opinion is that if a man's a blackguard when he's drunk, he's a blackguard when he's sober. What are you going to do, then? Well, it's quite evident we must find out about him. Leslie comes in, followed by her husband. She carries a hat in her hand. Well, I haven't been long, have I? I shall hold you up as an example to my Dorothy. She's probably not half as slow as you are. I can always dress in a quarter of the time that Robert can. I'll just go and start her up. Is there room for me, or shall I come along in the other car? Oh, there'll be plenty of room. Crosby and Withers go out. Leslie is about to follow. There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it? Just now, when I was looking at Hammond's body, it seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired when he was actually lying on the ground. Gives me the impression that you must have stood over him and fired and fired. Leslie putting her hand wearily on her forehead. I was trying to forget for a minute. Why did you do that? I didn't know I did. It's a question you must expect to be asked. I'm afraid you think I'm more cold-blooded than I am. I lost my head. After a certain time, everything is all blurred and confused. I'm awfully sorry. Don't let it worry you, then. I don't say it's very natural. I'm sorry to make a nuisance of myself. Shall we go? Come on. They go out. The head boy comes in and draws down the blinds that lead on to the veranda. He puts out the light and slips out. The room is in darkness. End of Act One Act Two of The Letter, a play in three acts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Letter, a play in three acts by W. Somerset Maugham. Act Two 
The scene is the visitor's room in the gale at Singapore. A bare room with whitewashed walls, on one of which hangs a large map of the Malay Peninsula. On another is a framed photograph of King George V. The window is barred. The only furniture consists of a table in polished pitch pine and half a dozen chairs. There are doors right and left. Through the window you see the green, luxuriant leaves of some tropical plants and the blue sky. When the curtain rises, Robert Crosby is seen standing at the window. He wears an air of profound dejection. He has on the clothes in which he is accustomed to walk over the estate, shorts and a khaki shirt. He holds his shabby old hat in his hand. He sighs deeply. The door on the left is opened and Joyce comes in. He is followed by Ong Chi Sang with a wallet. Ong Chi Sang is a Cantonese, small but trimly built. He is very neatly dressed in white ducks, patent leather shoes, and gay silk socks. He wears a gold wristwatch and invisible pants nez From his breast pocket protrudes a rolled gold fountain pen. Howard, I heard you were here. I'm waiting to see Leslie. I've come to see her too. Do you want me to clear out? No, of course not. You go along and see her when they send for you, and then she can come here. I wish they'd let me see her here. It's awful having to see her in a cell with that damned matron always there. I thought you'd probably look at the office this morning. I couldn't get away. After all, the work on the estate has got to go on, and if I'm not there to look after it, everything goes to blazes. I came into Singapore the moment I could. Oh, how I hate that damned estate. In point of fact, I don't think it's been a bad thing for you during these last few weeks to have some work that you were obliged to do. I dare say not. Sometimes I've thought I should go mad. You know you must pull yourself together, old man. You mustn't let yourself go to pieces. Oh, I'm all right. You look as if you hadn't had a bath for a week. Oh, I've had a bath all right. I know my kit's rather grubby, but it's all right for tramping over the estate. I came just as I was. I hadn't the heart to change. It's funny that you should have taken it all so much harder than your missus. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I know that. I don't mind confessing it. I'm all in. I'm like a lost sheep without Leslie. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. I'm so lonely without her. He catches sight of Ong Chi Sang. Who's that? Oh, that's my confidential clerk, Ong Chi Sang. Ong Chi Sang gives a little bow and smiles with a flash of white teeth. What's he come here for? I brought him with me in case I wanted him. Ong Chi Sang is as good a lawyer as I am. He took his degree in the University of Hong Kong. As soon as he's learnt the ins and outs of my business, he's going to set up an opposition. Hi, hi. And perhaps you'd better wait outside, Ong. I'll call you if I want you. Very good, sir. I shall be within earshot. It'll do if you're within call. Ong Chi Seng goes out. Oh, Howard, I wouldn't wish my worst enemy the agony I've gone through during these horrible weeks. You look as if you hadn't had much sleep lately, old thing. I haven't. I don't think I've closed my eyes the last three nights. Well, thank God it'll be over tomorrow. By the way, you'll clean yourself up a bit for the trial, won't you? Oh, yes, rather. I'm staying with you tonight. No, oh, are you? I'm glad. And you'll both come back to my house after the trial. Dorothy's determined to celebrate. I think it's monstrous that they should have kept Leslie in this filthy prison. I think they had to do that. Why couldn't they let her out on bail? It's a very serious charge, I'm afraid. Oh, this red tape. She did what any decent woman would do in her place. Leslie's the best girl in the world. She wouldn't hurt a fly. Why, hang it all, man. I've been married to her for ten years. Do you think I don't know her? 
God, if I'd got hold of that man, I'd have wrung his neck. I'd have killed him without a moment's hesitation. So would you. My dear fellow, everybody's on your side. Thank God nobody's got a good word to say for Hammond. I don't suppose a single member of the jury will go into the box without having already made up his mind to bring in a verdict of not guilty. Then the whole thing's a farce. She ought never to have been arrested in the first place. And then it's cruel, after all the poor girl's gone through, to subject her to the ordeal of a trial. There's not a soul I've met in Singapore, man or woman, who hasn't told me that Leslie was absolutely justified. The law is the law. She admits that she killed the man. It is terrible, and I'm dreadfully sorry both for you and for her. I don't matter two straws. But the fact remains that murder has been committed, and in a civilized community a trial is inevitable. Is it murder to exterminate noxious vermin? She shot him as she would have shot a mad dog. I should be wanting in my duty as your legal adviser if I didn't tell you that there is one point which causes me a little anxiety. If your wife had only shot Hammond once, the whole thing would have been absolutely plain sailing. Unfortunately, she fired six times. Her explanation is perfectly simple. Under the circumstances, anyone would have done the same. I dare say, and of course I think the explanation is very reasonable. Then what are you making a fuss about? It's no good closing our eyes to the facts. It's always a good plan to put yourself in another man's place. And I can't deny that if I were prosecuting for the Crown, that is the point on which I would centre my inquiry. Why? It suggests not so much panic as uncontrollable fury. Under the circumstances which your wife has described, one would expect a woman to be frightened out of her wits, but hardly beside herself with rage. Oh, isn't that rather far-fetched? I dare say. I just thought it was a point worth mentioning. I should have thought the really important thing was Hammond's character, and by heavens we found out enough about him. We found out that he was living with a Chinese woman, if that's what you mean. Well, isn't that enough? I dare say it is. It was certainly an awful shock to his friends. She's been actually living in his bungalow for the last eight months. Strange how angry that's made people. It's turned public opinion against him more than anything. I can tell you this. If I'd known it, I'd never have dreamed of letting him come to my place. I wonder how he managed to keep it so dark. Will she be one of the witnesses? I shan't call her. I shall produce evidence that he was living with her, and public feeling being what it is. I think that the jury will accept that as proof that Hammond was a man of notorious character. A Sikh sergeant of police comes into the room. He is tall, bearded, dark, and dressed in blue. Sikh to Crosby. You come now, Sahib. At last. You haven't got very long to wait now. Another twenty-four hours, she'll be a free woman. Why don't you take her somewhere for a trip? Even though we're almost dead certain to get an acquittal, a trial of this sort is anxious work. And you'll both of you want a rest. I think I shall want it more than Leslie. She's been a brick. Why, do you know, when I've been to see her, it wasn't I who cheered her up. It was she who cheered me up. By God, there's a plucky little woman for you, Howard. I agree. Her self-control is amazing. I won't keep her long. I know you're busy. Thanks. Crosby goes out with the Sikh policeman. Is my clerk outside, Sergeant? He has hardly spoken the words before Ong Chi Sen sidles in. Give me those papers you've got there, will you? Yes, sir. He takes a bundle of papers from his wallet and gives them to Joyce. Joyce sits down with them at the table. That's all long. If I want you, I'll call. May I trouble you for a few words, private conversation, sir? 
Hong Chi Sang expresses himself with elaborate accuracy. He has learnt English as a foreign language and speaks it perfectly, but he has trouble with his R's. He always turns them into L's, and this gives his careful speech every now and then a faintly absurd air. Joyce with a slight smile. It's no trouble, Ong. The matter upon which I desire to speak to you, sir, is delicate and confidential. Mrs. Crosby will be here in five minutes. Don't you think we might find a more suitable occasion for a heart-to-heart -heart talk? The matter on which I desire to speak to you, sir, has to do with the case of Al V. Crosby. Oh? Yes, sir. I have a great regard for your intelligence, Ol. I am sure I can trust you not to tell me anything that, as Mrs. Crosby's counsel, it is improper that I should be advised of. I think, sir, that you may rest assured of my discretion. I am a graduate of the University of Hong Kong, and I've won the Chancellor's Prize for English Composition. Fire away, then. A circumstance has come to my knowledge, sir, which seems to me to put a different complexion on this case. What circumstance? It has come to my knowledge, sir, that there is a letter in existence from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. I should not be at all surprised. In the course of the last seven years, I have no doubt that Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. That is very probable, sir. Mrs. Crosby must have communicated with the deceased frequently to invite him to dine with her, for example, or to propose a tennis game. That was my first idea when the matter was brought to my notice. This letter, however, is written on the day of the late Mr. Hammond's death. There is an instant's pause. Joyce, a faint smile of amusement in his eyes, continues to look intently at Ong Chi Sen. Who told you this? The circumstances were brought to my notice, sir, by a friend of mine. I have always known that your discretion was beyond praise, Ong Chi Seng. You will no doubt recall, sir, that Mrs. Clodsby has stated that until the fatal night she had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. Yes, I do. This letter indicates, in my opinion, that her statement was not in every respect accurate. Joyce stretching out his hand as though to take it. Have you got the letter? No, sir. Oh, I suppose you know its contents. My friend very kindly gave me a copy. Would you like to peruse it, sir? I should. Hong Chi Seng takes from an inside pocket a bulky wallet. It is filled with papers, Singapore dollars, and cigarette cards. Ah, I see you collect cigarette cards. Yes, sir. I am happy to say that I have a collection which is almost unique and very comprehensive. From the confusion he extracts a half-sheet of notepaper and places it before Joyce. Joyce, reading slowly, as though he could hardly believe his eyes. Robert will be away for the night. I absolutely must see you. I shall expect you at eleven. I am desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up, Leslie. What the devil does it mean? That is for you to say, sir. What makes you think that this letter was written by Mrs. Crosby? I have every confidence in the veracity of my informant, sir. That's more than I have. The matter can very easily be put to the proof. Mrs. Clodsby will no doubt be able to tell you at once 
whether she wrote such a letter or not. Joyce gets up and walks once or twice up and down the room. Then he stops and faces Aung Chi Sen. It is inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. If that is your opinion, sir, the matter is, of course, ended. My friend spoke to me on the subject only because he thought, as I was in your office, you might like to know of the existence of this letter before a communication was made to the public prosecutor. Who has the original? You will remember, sir, no doubt, that after the death of Mr. Hammond, it was discovered that he had had relations with a Chinese woman. The letter is at pleasant in her possession. They face each other for a moment silently. I am obliged to you, Ong. I will give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to make a communication to that effect to my friend? I dare say it would be as well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. He leaves the room. Joyce reads through the letter once more with knitted brows. He hears a sound and realizes that Leslie is coming. He places the copy of the letter among the papers on the table. Leslie comes in with the matron. This is a stout, middle-aged Englishwoman in a white dress. Leslie is very simply and neatly dressed. Her hair is done with her habitual care. She is cool and self-possessed. Good morning, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie comes forward graciously. She holds out her hand as calmly as though she were receiving him in her drawing room. How do you do? I wasn't expecting you so early. How are you today? I'm in the best of health, thank you. This is a wonderful place for a rest cure. And Mrs. Parker looks after me like a mother. How do you do, Mrs. Parker? Very well, thank you, sir. This I can't help saying. Mrs. Crosby, no one could be less trouble than what you are. I shall be sorry to lose you. And that's a fact. Leslie with a gracious smile. You've been very kind to me, Mrs. Parker. Well... I've been company for you. When you're not used to it, it's lonely, like in a place like this. It's a shame they ever put you here. If you want to know what I think about it. Well, Mrs. Parker, I dare say you won't mind leaving us. Mrs. Crosby and I have got business to talk about. Very good, sir. She goes out. Sometimes she drives me nearly mad. She's so chatty, poor dear. Isn't it strange how few people there are who can ever realize that you may be perfectly satisfied with your own company? You must have had plenty of that lately. I've read a great deal, you know, and I've worked at my lace. And it hardly ask if you've slept well. I've slept like a top. The time has really passed very quickly. It's evidently agreed with you. You're looking very much better and stronger than a few weeks ago. That's more than poor Robert is. He's a wreck, poor darling. I'm thankful for his sake that it'll all be over tomorrow. I think he's just about at the end of his tether. He's very much more anxious about you than you appear to be about yourself. Won't you sit down? Thank you. They seat themselves, Joyce at the table, with his papers in front of him. I'm not exactly looking forward to the trial, you know. One of the things that has impressed me is that each time you've told your story... You've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. Leslie gently chafing him. What does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory, or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. I suppose I am right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe? Leslie with a friendly little smile. Oh, quite. I'm positive of that. The last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFerrins. I don't think I said more than two words to him. They have two courts, you know, and we didn't happen to be in the same sets. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. 
Are you perfectly certain of that? Oh, perfectly. There was nothing I should write to him for, except to ask him to dine or to play tennis, and I hadn't done either for months. At one time you'd been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you had stopped asking him to anything? Leslie, with a little shrug of the shoulders. One gets tired of people. We hadn't anything very much in common. Of course, when he was ill, Robert and I did everything we could for him. But the last year or two, he's been quite well, and he's very popular. He had a good many calls on his time, and there didn't seem to be any need to shower invitations upon him. Are you quite certain that was all? Leslie hesitates for a moment and reflectively looks down. Well, of course, I knew about the Chinese woman. I'd actually seen her. Oh, you never mentioned that. It wasn't a very pleasant thing to talk about, and I knew you'd find out for yourselves soon enough. Under the circumstances, I didn't think it would be very nice of me to be the first to tell you about his private life. What was she like? Leslie gives a slight start and a hard look suddenly crosses her face. Oh, horrible. Stout and painted and powdered, covered with gold chains and bangles and pins. Not even young. She's older than I am. And it was after you knew about her that you ceased having anything to do with Hammond? Yes. But you said nothing about it to your husband? It wasn't the sort of thing I cared to talk to Robert about. Joyce watches her for a moment. Any suggestion of emotion that showed itself on her face when she spoke of the Chinese woman has left it, and she is now once more cool and self-possessed. I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. In the past, I've often sent him little notes to ask him to something or other, or to get me something when I knew he was going into Singapore. This letter asks him to come and see you because Robert was going to Singapore. Leslie smiling. That's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. You'd better read it for yourself. He takes it from among the papers in front of him and hands it to her. She gives it a moment's glance and hands it back. That's not my handwriting. I know. It's said to be an exact copy of the original. She takes the letter again and now reads the words. And as she reads, a horrible change comes over her. Her colorless face grows dreadful to look at. The flesh seems on a sudden to fall away, and her skin is tightly stretched over the bones. She stares at Joyce with eyes that start from their sockets. What does it mean? That is for you to say. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. Be very careful what you say. If the original is in your handwriting, it would be useless to deny it. It would be forgery. It would be difficult to prove that. It would be easy to prove that it was genuine. A shiver passes through her body. She takes out a handkerchief and wipes the palms of her hands. She looks at the letter again. It's not dated. If I had written it and forgotten all about it, it might have been written years ago. If you'll give me time, I'll try to remember the circumstances. I noticed there was no date. If this letter were in the hands of the prosecution, they would cross-examine your houseboys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. She clasps her hands violently and sways on her chair so that you might think she would faint. I swear to you that I did not write that letter. In that case, we need not go into the matter further. If the person who possesses this letter sees fit to place it in the hands of the prosecution... You will be prepared. There is a long pause. Joyce waits for Leslie to speak, but she stares straight in front of her. If you have nothing more to say to me, I think I'll be getting back to my office. Leslie still not looking at him. What would anyone who read the letter be inclined to think that it meant? He'd know that you had told a deliberate lie. When? 
when you stated definitely that you had had no communication with Hammond for at least six weeks. The whole thing has been a terrible shock to me. The events of that horrible night have been a nightmare. It's not very strange if one detail has escaped my memory. Your memory has reproduced very exactly every particular of your interview with Hammond. It is very strange that you should have forgotten so important a point as that he came to the bungalow on the night of his death at your expressed desire. I hadn't forgotten. Then why didn't you mention it? I was afraid to. I thought you'd none of you believe my story if I admitted that he'd come at my invitation. I dare say it was very stupid of me. I lost my head. And after I'd once said that I'd had no communication with Hammond, I was obliged to stick to it. You will be required to explain then why you asked Hammond to come to you when Robert was away for the night. It was a surprise I was preparing for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and, you know, I'm dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I wanted to talk to Jeff about it. I thought I'd get him to order it for me. Perhaps the terms of the letter are not very clear to your recollection. Will you have another look at it? Leslie quickly drawing back. No, I don't want to. Then I must read it to you. Robert will be away for the night. I absolutely must see you. I shall expect you at eleven. I am desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up. Leslie. Does it seem to you the sort of a letter a woman would write to a rather distant acquaintance because she wanted to consult him about buying a gun? I dare say it's rather extravagant and emotional. I do express myself like that, you know. I'm quite prepared to admit it's rather silly. I must have been very much mistaken. I always thought you a very reserved and self-possessed woman. And after all, Jeff Hammond wasn't quite a distant acquaintance. When he was ill, I nursed him like a mother. By the way, did you call him Jeff? Everybody did. He wasn't the kind of man anyone would think of calling Mr. Hammond. Why did you ask him to come at so late an hour? Leslie recovering her self-possession. Is Eleven very late? He was always dining somewhere or other. I thought he'd look in on his way home. And why did you ask him not to drive up? Leslie with a shrug of the shoulder. You know how Chinese boys gossip. If they'd heard him come, the last thing they'd ever have thought was that he was there for a perfectly innocent purpose. Joyce gets up and walks once or twice up and down the room. Then, leaning over the back of his chair, he speaks in a tone of deep gravity. Mrs. Crosby, I want to talk to you very, very seriously. This case was comparatively plain sailing. There was only one point that seemed to me to require explanation. As far as I could judge, you had fired no less than four shots into Hammond when he was lying on the ground. It was hard to accept the possibility that a delicate, frightened woman of gentle nurture and refined instincts should have surrendered to an absolutely uncontrollable frenzy. But, of course, it was admissible. Although Geoffrey Hammond was much liked and on the whole thought highly of, I was prepared to prove that he was the sort of man who might be guilty of the crime which in justification of your act you accused him of. The fact, which was discovered after his death, that he had been living with a Chinese woman, gave us something very definite to go upon. That robbed him of any sympathy that might have been felt for him. We made up our minds to make every use of the odium that such a connection cast upon him in the minds of all respectable people. I told your husband just now, that I was certain of an acquittal, and I wasn't just telling him that to cheer him up. I do not believe the jury would have left the box. They look into each other's eyes. Leslie is strangely still. She is like a bird paralyzed by the fascination of a snake. But this letter has thrown an entirely different complexion on the case. I am your legal adviser. I shall represent you in court. I take your story as you tell it to me, and I shall conduct your defence according to its terms. It may be that I believe your statements, or it may be that I doubt them. 
The duty of counsel is to persuade the jury that the evidence placed before them is not such as to justify them in bringing in a verdict of guilty. And any private opinion he may have of the innocence or guilt of his client is entirely beside the point. I don't know what you're driving at. You are not going to deny that Hammond came to your house at your urgent, and may I even say hysterical invitation? Leslie does not answer for a moment. She seems to consider. They can prove that the letter was taken to his bungalow by one of the houseboys. He rode over on his bicycle. You mustn't expect other people to be stupider than you. The letter will put them on the track of suspicions that have entered nobody's head. I will not tell you what I personally thought when I read it. I do not wish you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Leslie crumples up suddenly. She falls to the floor in a dead faint before Joyce can catch her. He looks round the room for water, but can find none. He glances at the door, but will not call for help. He does not wish to be disturbed. He kneels down beside her, waiting for her to recover, and at last she opens her eyes. Keep quite still. You'll be better in a minute. Don't let anyone come. No, no. Mr. Joyce, you won't let them hang me. She begins to cry hysterically. He tries in undertones to calm her. Shh, shh. Don't make a noise. Shh, shh. It's all right. Don't. Don't, don't. For goodness sake, pull yourself together. Give me a minute. You see the effort she makes to regain her self-control, and soon she is once more calm. You've got pluck. I think no one could deny that. Let me get up now. It was silly of me to faint. He gives her his hand and helps her to her feet. He leads her to a chair, and she sinks down wearily. Do you feel a little better? Leslie, with her eyes closed. Don't talk to me for a moment or two. Very well. Leslie, at last, with a little sigh. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You distrusted me from the beginning. That's neither here nor there. She gives him a glance and then looks down. Isn't it possible to get hold of the letter? With a frown to conceal his embarrassment. I don't think anything would have been said to me about it if the person in whose possession it is was not prepared to sell it. Who's got it? The Chinese woman who was living in Hammond's house. Leslie instinctively clenches her hands, but again controls herself. Does she want an awful lot for it? I imagine she has a pretty shrewd idea of its value. I doubt if it would be possible to get hold of it except for a very large sum. Are you going to let me be hanged? Do you think it's so simple as all that to secure possession of an unwelcome piece of evidence? You say the woman is prepared to sell it. But I don't know that I am prepared to buy it. Why not? I don't think you know what you are asking me. Heaven knows I don't wish to make phrases. But I've always thought I was by way of being an honest man. You're asking me to do something that is no different from suborning a witness. Do you mean to say you can save me, and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I'm sorry it sounds cruel. I want to do my best for you, Mrs. Crosby. A lawyer has a duty not only to his client, but also to his profession. Then what is going to happen to me? Justice must take its course. Leslie grows very pale. A little shudder passes through her body. When she answers, her voice is low and quiet. I put myself in your hands. Of course, I have no right to ask you to do anything that isn't proper— I was asking more for Robert's sake than for mine. But if you knew everything, I believe you'd think I was deserving of your pity. Poor old Bob. It'll nearly kill him. He's utterly unprepared. If I'm hanged, it certainly won't bring Jeff Hammond back to life again. 
There is a moment's silence while Joyce reflects upon the situation. Sometimes I think that when we say our honour prevents us from doing this or that, we deceive ourselves, and our real motive is vanity. I ask myself, what really is the explanation of that letter? I daren't ask you. It's not fair to you to conclude from it that you killed Hammond without provocation. It's absurd how fond I am of Bob. You see, I've known him so long. His life may very well be ruined, too. I know I have no right to ask you to do anything for me, but Robert is so kind and simple and good. I think he's never done anyone any harm in his life. Can't you save him from this bitter pain and this disgrace? You mean everything in the world to him, don't you? I suppose so. I'm very grateful for the love he's given me. Joyce making his resolution. I'm going to do what I can for you. She gives a little gasp of relief. But don't think I don't know I'm doing wrong. I am. I'm doing it with my eyes open. It can't be wrong to save a suffering woman. You're doing no harm to anybody else. You don't understand. It's only natural. Let's not discuss that. Do you know anything about Bob's circumstances? He has a good many tin shares and a part interest in two or three rubber estates. I suppose he could raise money. He would have to be told what it was for. Will it be necessary to show him the letter? Don't you want him to see it? No. I shall do everything possible to prevent him from seeing it till after the trial. He will be an important witness. I think it's very necessary that he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And afterwards? I'll still do my best for you. Not for my sake. For his. If he loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. It's rather frightening. He knows that he loves me. Nothing else matters. Joyce goes to the door and opens it. Mrs. Parker, I'm just going. Mrs. Parker comes in again. Gracious, how white you look, Mrs. Crosby. Mr. Joyce hasn't been upsetting you, has he? You look like a ghost. Leslie graciously smiling with an instinctive resumption of her social manner. No, he's been kindness itself. I dare say the strain is beginning to tell on me a little. She holds out her hand to Joyce. Goodbye. It's good of you to take all this trouble for me. I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am. I shan't see you again till just before the trial tomorrow. I've got a lot to do before then. I've been making Mrs. Parker a lace collar, and I want to get it done before I leave here. It's so grand. I shall never be able to bring myself to wear it. She makes beautiful lace. You'd be surprised. I know she does. I'm afraid it's my only accomplishment. Good morning, Mrs. Parker. Good morning, sir. She goes out accompanied by Leslie. Joyce gathers his papers together. There is a knock at the door. Come in. The door is opened and Ong Chi Seng enters. I desire to remind you, sir, that you have an appointment with Mr. Leed of Leed and Pollock at 12.30. Joyce with a glance at his watch. Uh, he'll have to wait. Very good, sir. He goes to the door and is about to go out. Then, as though on an afterthought, he stops. Is there anything further you wish me to say to my friend, sir? What friend? About the letter which Mrs. Clausby wrote to Hammond, deceased, sir. Joyce very casually. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. I mentioned it to Mrs. Crosby, and she denies having written anything of the sort. It's evidently a forgery. He takes out the copy from the papers in front of him and hands it to Ong Chi Seng. The Chinaman ignores the gesture. In that case, sir, I suppose there would be no objection 
if my friend delivered the letter to the public prosecutor? None. I don't quite see what good that would do your friend. My friend thought it was his duty, sir, in the interests of justice. I'm the last man in the world to interfere with anyone who wishes to do his duty, Ong. I quite understand, sir. But from my study of the case, R. V. Crosby, I am of the opinion that the production of such a letter would be damaging to our client. I've always had a high opinion of your legal acumen, Ong Chi Seng. It has occurred to me, sir, that if I could persuade my friend to induce the Chinese woman who has the letter to deliver it into our hands, it would save a great deal of trouble. I suppose your friend is a businessman. Under what circumstances do you think he would be induced to part with the letter? He has not got the letter. No. Oh. Has he got a friend, too? The Chinese woman has got the letter. He is only a relation of the Chinese woman. She is an ignorant woman. She did not know the value of the letter till my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Good God! Where on earth do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can get ten thousand dollars? I tell you, the letter's a forgery. Mr. Crosby owns an eighth share of the Bekong Lubber Estate and a sixth share of the Kelantan Liver Lubber Estate. I have a friend who will lend him the money on the security of his properties. You have a large circle of acquaintances on. Yes, sir. Well, you can tell them all to go to hell. I would never advise Mr. Crosby to give a penny more than five thousand for a letter that can be very easily explained. The Chinese woman does not want to sell the letter, sir. My friend took a long time to persuade her. It is useless to offer her less than the sum mentioned. Ten thousand dollars is an awful lot. Mr. Crosby will certainly pay it, rather than see his wife hanged by the neck, sir. Why did your friend fix upon that particular amount? I will not attempt to conceal anything from you, sir. Upon making inquiry, sir, my friend came to the conclusion that ten thousand dollars was the largest sum Mr. Crosby could possibly get. Yeah, that is precisely what occurred to me. Well, I will speak to Mr. Crosby. Mr. Crosby is still here, sir. Oh? What's he doing? We have only a very short time, sir. And the matter, in my opinion, looks of no delay. In that case, be brief, Ong. It occurred to me that you would wish to speak to Mr. Clodsby, and therefore I took the liberty of asking him to wait. If it would be convenient for you to speak to him now, sir, I could impart your decision to my friend when I have my tiffin. Where is the Chinese woman now? She is staying in the house of my friend, sir. Will she come to my office? I think it more better for you to go to her, sir. I can take you to the house tonight, and she will give you the letter. She is a very ignorant woman, and she does not understand checks. I wasn't thinking of giving her a check. I should bring banknotes with me. It would only be a waste of time to bring less than ten thousand dollars, sir. I quite understand. Shall I tell Mr. Closby that you wish to see him, sir? Ong Chi Seng? Yes, sir. Is there anything else you know? No, sir. I am of the opinion that a confidential clerk should have no secrets from his employer. May I ask why you make this inquiry, sir? Call Mr. Crosby. Very good, sir. 
He goes out and in a moment opens the door once more for Crosby. It's good of you to have waited, old man. Your clerk said you particularly wished me to. Joyce, as casually as he can. A rather unpleasant thing has happened, Bob. It appears that your wife sent a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. But that's impossible. She's always stated that she had had no communication with Hammond. I know from my own knowledge that she hadn't set eyes upon him for a couple of months. The fact remains that the letter exists. It's in the possession of the Chinese woman Hammond was living with. What did she write to him for? Your wife meant to give you a present on your birthday, and she wanted Hammond to help her to get it. Your birthday was just about then, wasn't it? Yes, in point of fact, it was a fortnight ago today. In the emotional excitement that she suffered from after the tragedy, she forgot that she'd written a letter to him, and having once denied having any communication with Hammond, she was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. Why? My dear fellow, it was of course very unfortunate, but I dare say it was not unnatural. That's unlike Leslie. I've never known her afraid of anything. The circumstances were exceptional. Does it very much matter? If she's asked about it, she can explain. It would be very awkward if this letter found its way into the hands of the prosecution. Your wife has lied. She would be asked some difficult questions. Leslie would never tell a lie intentionally. Joyce with a shadow of impatience. My dear Bob, you must try to understand. Don't you see that it alters things a good deal if Hammond did not intrude, an unwanted guest, but came to your house by invitation? It would be easy to arouse in the jury a certain indecision of mind. I may be very stupid, but I don't understand. You lawyers, you seem to take a delight in making mountains out of mole heaps. After all, Howard, you're not only my lawyer, you're the oldest friend I have in the world. I know. That is why I'm taking a step, the gravity of which I can never expect you to realize. I think we must get hold of that letter, and want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. I don't think it's right, but I think it's expedient. Juries are very stupid. I think it's just as well not to worry them with more evidence than they can conveniently deal with. Well, I don't pretend to understand, but I'm perfectly prepared to leave myself in your hands. Go ahead and do as you think fit. I'll pay. All right. And now put the matter out of your mind. That's easy. I could never bring myself to believe that Leslie had ever done anything that wasn't absolutely square and above board. Let's go to the club. I badly want a whiskey and soda. End of Act Two Act Three of The Letter, a play in three acts, as premiered in London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Letter, a play in three acts by W. Somerset Maugham. Since a play is published not only to gratify an author's vanity, but also for the convenience of amateurs, I have thought it well to print here the version acted at the playhouse. After two or three rehearsals, I replaced Leslie Crosby's final confession with a throwback, because I thought it would bore an audience to listen to two long narratives in one play. I have a notion that an author may prudently take a risk to avoid tediousness. Act Three Scene One The scene is a small room in the Chinese quarter of Singapore. The walls are whitewashed, but dirty and bedraggled, on one of them hangs a cheap Chinese oleograph, stained and discolored, on another, unframed and pinned up, a picture of a nude from one of the illustrated papers. The only furniture consists of a sandalwood box and a low Chinese pallet bed, 
with a lacquered neck rest. There is a closed window, which is at the back, and a door on the right. It is night, and the room is lit by one electric light, a globe without a shade. When the curtain rises, Chung Hee is lying on the pallet bed with his opium pipe, his lamp, and the tray on which are the little tin of opium and a couple of long needles. He is reading a Chinese paper. He is a fat Chinaman in white trousers and a singlet. On his feet are Chinese slippers. A boy, dressed in the same way, is seated on the sandalwood chest, idly playing a Chinese flute. He plays a strange Chinese tune. Chung He dips his needle in the opium and heats it over the flame of the lamp, puts it in the pipe, inhales and presently blows out a thick cloud of smoke. There is a scratching at the door. Chung He speaks a few words in Chinese, and the boy goes to it and just opens it. The boy speaks to the person there, and still from the door says something to Chung He. Chung He makes answer and gets up from the pallet bed, putting his opium things aside. The door is opened wider, and Ong Chi Sang comes in. This way, sir, please. Come in. Joyce enters wearing his toppy. I nearly broke my neck on those stairs. This is my friend, sir. Does he speak English? Ah, uh, yes. Why, speaky fairy good. How are do you do, sir? I uh, uh, hope you are quite well. Please do come in. Good evening. Uh, I say, the air in here is awful. Couldn't we have the window open? I dare fairy but, sir. You may bring thief air. We'll risk it. Very good, sir. I will open the window. He goes to it and does so, Joyce taking off his toppy and putting it down. I see you've been smoking. Uh, yes, my chauffeur fairy but for my boy. Smoky do for we pipers make it more than hair. We'd better get to our business. Yes, sir. Business is business, as we say. What is your friend's name, Ong? Michael we Oh, shame. Shungaki. You know, she him white and on chop. Shungaki. Janawala Tiwa. I suppose you know what I've come for? Oh, yes, sir. My fairy clan do see you in uh, my house. My gift you my business card. Oh, yes. I don't think I need it. I show you very good China D. Ho shame Zhu Chong. Number one quality. My can show more cheap than you buy. That should us. I don't want any tea. My show you Zwadile Shuka. Very best quality. No can get more bad hair in China. Make fairy good as us. I show you cheaper. I don't want any silk. Very well. You take my business card. Shungati. Janawala Tiwa. Do cheeks up for a Victoria Stoita. My happy you want some tomorrow or next day. Have you got this letter? Shiny Schumann half a cot. Where is she? She come pleasant with. Why the devil isn't she here? She here all night. She come pleasant with. She where do you come? She? More better you tell her to come, I think. Yes, I tell her come this minute. He speaks to the boy in Chinese, who gives a guttural, monosyllabic reply and goes out. To Joyce. You sit down, I guess. I prefer to stand. Chung He handing him a green tin of cigarettes. You smoky, she go wet, very good, she go wet, oh shame, for we got shorts. I don't want to smoke. Chung He to Joyce. 
You and she buy China D very cheap. Number one quality. Go to hell. Oh, I don't. I no shop D. Maybe you like a swap of silk. No? You and she chippy jade. Half cut. Stewing number one quality. I show you one thousand dollars. Very nice of present you are miss us. Go to hell. Oh, I don't. The door is opened and the boy comes in again with a tray on which are bowls of tea. He takes it to Joyce, who shakes his head and turns away. The others help themselves. Why the devil doesn't this woman come? I think she come now, sir. There is a scratching at the door. I'm curious to see her. My friends say that poor Mr. Hammond, deceased, was completely under her thumb, sir. She no speak English. She speak my way under Chinese. Meanwhile, the boy has gone to the door and opened it. The Chinese woman comes in. She wears a silk sarong and a long muslin coat over a blouse. On her arms are heavy gold bangles. She wears a gold chain round her neck and gold pins in her shining black hair. Her cheeks and mouth are painted, and she is heavily powdered. Arched eyebrows make a thin, dark line over her eyes. She comes in and walks slowly to the pallet bed and sits on the edge of it with her legs dangling. Ong Chi Seng makes an observation to her in Chinese, and she briefly answers. She takes no notice of the white man. Has she got the letter? Yes, sir. Where is it? She's a very ignorant woman, sir. I think she wants to see the money before she gives the letter. Very well. The Chinese woman takes a cigarette from the tin and lights it. She appears to take no notice of what is proceeding. Joyce counts out the ten thousand dollars and hands them to Ong Chi Seng. Ong Chi Seng counts them for himself, while Chung He watches him. They are all grave, businesslike, and the Chinese are oddly unconcerned. The sum is quite collect, sir. The Chinese woman takes the letter from her tunic and hands it to Ong Chi Seng. Ong Chi Seng gives it a glance. This is the light document, sir. He hands it to Joyce, who reads it silently. There's not very much for the money. I am sure that you will not regret it, sir. Considering all the circumstances, it is what you call dirt cheap. I know that you have too great a regard for me to allow me to pay more for an article on the market price. Shall you want me for anything else tonight, please, sir? I don't think so. In that case, sir, if it is convenient, I will stay here and talk to my friend. I suppose you want to divide the swag. I am sorry, sir, that that is a word I have not come across in my studies. You'd better look it out in the dictionary. Yes, sir. I will do it without delay. I've been wondering how much you were going to get out of this, Ong Chi Seng. The laborer is worthy of his hire, as our Lord said, sir. I didn't know you were a Christian, Ong. I am not, sir, to the best of my belief. In that case, he certainly isn't your Lord. I was only making use of the common English idiom, sir. In point of fact, I am a disciple of the late Herbert Spencer. I have also been much influenced by Nietzsche, Shaw, and Herbert G. Wells. It is no wonder that I am no match for you. As he goes out, the curtain falls quickly. Scene 2 the scene is the same as in Act I, the sitting room at the Crosby's bungalow. It is about five o'clock in the afternoon, and the light is soft and mellow. When the curtain rises, the stage is empty, but immediately the sound is heard of a car stopping.
and Mrs. Joyce and Withers come up the steps of the veranda and enter the room. They are followed in an instant by the head boy and another Chinese servant, one with a suitcase and the other with a large basket. Mrs. Joyce is a buxom, florid, handsome woman of about forty. Good gracious, how desolate the place looks. You can see in the twinkling of an eye that there hasn't been a woman here to look after things. I must say it does look a bit dreary. I knew it. I felt it in my bones. That's why I wanted to get here before Leslie. I thought we might have a chance to do a little something before she came. She goes over to the piano, opens it, and puts a piece of music on the stand. A few flowers would help. I wonder if these wretched boys will have had the sense to pick some. To the head boy who bears the basket. Is the ice all right, boy? Yeah, Missy. Well, put it in some place where it won't melt. Are there any flowers? My hooky see. Mrs. Joyce to the other boy. Oh, that's my bag. Put it in the spare room. The two servants go out. You know, I can't help wondering how Mrs. Crosby can bring herself to come back here. My poor friend, the Crosbys haven't got half a dozen houses to choose from. When you've only one house, I suppose you've got to live in it no matter what's happened. At all events, I should have liked to wait a bit. I wanted her to. I'd made all my plans for them both to come back to my house after the trial. I wanted them to stay with me till they were able to get away for a holiday. I should have thought that much the most sensible thing to do. But they wouldn't. Bob said he couldn't leave the estate, and Leslie said she couldn't leave Bob. So then I said Howard and I would come down here. I thought it would be easier for them if they had someone with them for a day or two. Withers with a smile. And I think you were determined not to be robbed of your celebration? You don't know my million-dollar cocktails, do you? They're celebrated all through the FMS. When Leslie was arrested, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another until she was acquitted. I've been waiting for this day, and no one is going to deprive me of my treat. Hence the ice, I suppose. Hence the ice, wise young man. As soon as the others come, I'll start making them. With your own hands? With my own hands, I don't mind telling you I never knew anyone who could make a better cocktail than I can. Withers with a grin. We all think the cocktails we make ourselves better than anybody else's, you know. Yes, but you're all lamentably mistaken, and I happen to be right. Uh, the ways of providence are dark. The two boys come in with bowls of flowers. They place them here and there so that the room looks exactly as it did during the first act. Oh, good. That makes the room look much more habitable. They ought to be here in a minute. We went very fast, you know, and I dare say a good many people wanted to say a word or two to Leslie. I don't suppose they were able to get away as quickly as they expected. The boys go out. I'll wait till they come, shall I? Of course, you must wait. I thought the Attorney General was very decent. I knew he would be. I know his wife, you know. She said she thought Leslie should never be tried at all. But of course, men are so funny. I shall never forget the shout that went up when the jury came in and said, not guilty. It was thrilling, wasn't it? And Leslie absolutely impassive, sitting there as though it had nothing to do with her. I can't get over the way she gave her evidence. By George, she's a marvel. It was beautiful. I couldn't help crying. It was so modest and so restrained. Howard, who thinks me very hysterical and impulsive, told me the other day he'd never known a woman who had so much self-control as Leslie. And that's real praise, because I don't think he very much likes her. Why not? Oh, you know what men are. They never care very much for the women their particular friends marry. The head boy comes in with a pillow covered by a cloth. Hello, what's this? 
This ain't no one race. Mrs. Joyce going to it and taking the cloth off. Oh, did you bring that? I thought maybe Missy wants you. He puts it down on the table on which it stood in the first act. I'm sure she will. That was very thoughtful of you, boy. To withers as the boy goes out. <laughs> you know, sometimes you could kill these Chinese boys. And then all of a sudden, they'll do things that are so kind and so considerate that you forgive them everything. Withers looking at the lace. By George, it is beautiful, isn't it? You know, it's just the sort of thing you'd expect her to do. Mr. Withers, I want to ask you something rather horrible. When you came that night, where exactly was Jeff Hammond's body lying? Out on the veranda, just under that lamp. My God, it gave me a turn when I ran up the steps and nearly fell over him. Has it occurred to you that every time Leslie comes into the house, she'll have to step over the place where the body lay? It's rather grim. Perhaps it won't strike her. Fortunately, she's not the sort of hysterical fool that I am, but I, oh dear, I could never sleep again. There is the sound of a car driving up. There they are. They haven't been so long, after all. Mrs. Joyce going over to the veranda. No, they must have started within ten minutes of us. Leslie! Leslie! Leslie comes in, followed by Crosby and Joyce. Crosby is wearing a neat suit of ducks. Leslie wears a silk wrap and a hat. You haven't been here long, have you? Mrs. Joyce, taking her in her arms. Welcome, welcome back to your home. Leslie releasing herself. Darling. She looks round. How nice and cozy it looks. I can hardly realize that I've ever been away. Are you tired? Would you like to go and lie down? Tired? Why, I've been doing nothing but rest for the last six weeks. Oh, Bob, aren't you happy to have her back again? Now, Dorothy, don't gush. If you must gush, gush over me. I'm not going to gush over you, you old brute. What have you done? Leslie holding out her hand to him with a charming smile. He's done everything. I can never thank him enough. You don't know what he's been to me through all this dreary time of waiting. I don't mind confessing that I thought you made rather a good speech, Howard. Well, thank you for those kind words. I think perhaps you might have been a little more impassioned without hurting yourself. I don't agree with you, Mrs. Joyce. It's just because it was so cold and measured and businesslike that it was so effective. Well, let's have this drink you've been talking about, Dorothy. Come and help me, Mr. Withers. When I make a cocktail, I want a great many assistants. Leslie taking off her hat. I know what an elaborate business your million-dollar cocktail is, Dorothy. Mrs. Joyce says she goes out with Withers. Don't be impatient. I can't hurry it. I must take my time. I'll go and tidy myself up. You don't need it. You look as if you just come out of a bandbox. I shan't be a minute. There's something I particularly want to say to you. I'll make myself scarce. No, I want you, old man. I want your legal opinion. No. Do you? Fire away. Well, look here. I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. I think a bit of a holiday would do you both good. Could you get away, Robert? Even if it's only for two or three weeks, I'd be thankful. What's the use of two or three weeks? We must get away for good. But how can we? You can't very well throw off a job like this. You'd never get such a good one again, you know. That's where you're wrong. I've got something in view that's much better. We can neither of us live here. It would be impossible. We've gone through too much in this bungalow. How can we ever forget? Leslie with a shudder. No, don't, Bob. Don't. Crosby to Joyce. You see, heaven knows Leslie has nerves of iron. But there's a limit to human endurance. 
You know how lonely the life is. I should never have a moment's peace when I was out and thought of her sitting in this room by herself. It's out of the question. Oh, don't think of me, Bob. You've made this estate. It was nothing when you came here. Why, it's like your child. It's the apple of your eye. I hate it now. I hate every tree on it. I must get away. And so must you. You don't want to stay. It's all been so miserable. I don't want to make any more difficulties. I know our only chance of peace is to get someplace where we can forget. But could you get another job? Yes, that's just it. Something suddenly cropped up. That's why I wanted to talk to you about it at once. It's in Sumatra. We'd be right away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life with new friends. The only thing is that you'd be awfully lonely, darling. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'm used to loneliness. I'd be glad to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead, and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? I hope it'll be better. At all events, I shall be working for myself and not for a rotten company in London. Joy startled. What do you mean by that? You're not buying an estate. Yes, I am. Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? It's a chance in a thousand. It belongs to a Malacca Chinaman who's in financial difficulties and he's willing to let it go for $30,000 if we can have the money the day after tomorrow. But how are you going to raise $30,000? Well, I've saved about 10000 since I've been in the East and Charlie Meadows is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Leslie and Joyce exchange a glance of consternation. It seems rather rash to put all your eggs in one basket. I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account, Robert. You needn't worry about me, really. I shall settle down here quite comfortably. Don't talk nonsense, darling. It's only a moment ago that you said you'd give anything to clear out. I spoke without thinking. I believe it would be a mistake to run away. The sensible thing to do is to sit tight. Everybody's been so kind. There's no reason to suppose they're not going to continue. I'm sure all our friends will do all they can to make things easy for us. You know, dear, you mustn't be frightened of a little risk. It's only if one takes risks that one can make big money. These Chinese estates are never any good. You know how haphazard and careless the Chinese are. This is not that sort of thing at all. It belongs to a very progressive Chinaman, and he's had a European manager. It's not a leap in the dark. It's a thoroughly sound proposition, and I reckon that in ten years I can make enough money to allow us to retire. Then we'll settle down in England and live like lords. Honestly, Robert, I'd prefer to stay here. I'm attached to the place, and when I've had time to forget all that has happened... How can you forget? Anyhow... It's not a thing that you must enter into without due consideration. You'd naturally want to go over to Sumatra and look for yourself. That's just it. I've got to make up my mind at once. The offer only holds for 36 hours. But my dear fellow, you can't pay $30,000 for an estate without proper investigation. None of you planters are any too businesslike. But really, there are limits. Don't try to make me out a bigger fool than I am. I had it examined, and it's worth 50000 if it's worth a dollar. I've got all the papers in my office. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Oh, come, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. Darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I want to go, too. I can't stay here any more. Oh, why are you so obstinate? Come, come, dear. Don't be unreasonable. Let me go and get the papers. I shan't be a minute. He goes out. There is a moment's silence. Leslie looks at Joyce with terrified appeal. He makes a despairing gesture. I had to pay $10,000 for the letter. 
What are you going to do? Joyce miserably. What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. Give me a little time. I'm at the end of my strength. I can't bear anything more. You heard what he said. He wants the money at once to buy this estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Give me a little time. I can't afford to give you a sum like that. No, I don't expect you to. Perhaps I can get it somehow. How? You know it's impossible. It's money I put by for the education of my boys. I was glad to advance it, and I wouldn't have minded waiting a few weeks. If you'd only give me a month, I'd have time to think of something. I could prepare Robert and explain to him by degrees. I'd watch for my opportunity. If he buys this estate, the money will be gone. No, no, no. I can't let him do that. I don't want to be unkind to you, but I can't lose my money. Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, what shall I do? I'm dreadfully sorry for you. Oh, don't be sorry for me. I don't matter. It's Robert. It'll break his heart. If there were only some other way... I don't know what to do. I suppose you're right. There's only one thing to do. Tell him. Tell him and have done with it. I'm broken. Crosby comes in again with a bundle of papers in his hand and two large photographs. Of course, if it hadn't been for Leslie, I should have run over to Sumatra last week. I'd just like you to have a look first at the report I've had. Look here, Bob. Has it struck you that your costs over this affair will be pretty heavy? I know all you lawyers are robbers. I dare say this will leave me a little short of ready money, but I don't suppose you'd mind if I keep you waiting till I've had time to settle down. You know I can be trusted, and if you like, I'll pay you interest. I don't think you have any idea how large the sum is. Of course, we don't want to press you, but we can't be out of our money indefinitely. I think I should warn you that when you've settled with us, you won't have much money left over to embark in rather hazardous speculations. You're putting the fear of God into me. How much will the costs come to? I'm not going to charge you anything for my personal services. Whatever I've done has been done out of pure friendship. But there are certain out-of-pocket expenses that I'm afraid you must pay. Of course, it's awfully good of you not to wish to charge me for anything else. I hardly like to accept. What do the out-of-pocket expenses amount to? You remember that I told you yesterday that there was a letter of Leslie's that I thought we ought to get hold of? Yes, I really didn't think it mattered very much, but of course I put myself in your hands. I thought you were making a great deal out of something that wasn't very important. You told me to do what I thought fit, and I bought the letter from the person in whose possession it was. I had to pay a great deal of money for it. What a bore. Still, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? I'm afraid I had to pay $10,000 for it. $10,000? Why, that's a fortune. I thought you were going to say a couple of hundred. You must have been mad. You may be quite sure that I wouldn't have given it if I could have got it for less. But that's everything I have in the world. It reduces me to beggary. Not that exactly. But you must understand that you haven't got money to buy an estate with. But why didn't you let them bring the letter in and tell them to do what they damned well liked? I didn't dare. Do you mean to say it was absolutely necessary to suppress the letter? If you wanted your wife acquitted. But, but, I don't understand. They're not going to tell me that they could have brought in a verdict of guilty. They couldn't have hanged her for putting a noxious vermin out of the way. Of course they wouldn't have hanged her. They might have found her guilty of manslaughter. I dare say she'd have got off with two or three years. Three years? My Leslie! My little Leslie! It would have killed her! But what was there in the letter? I told you yesterday... It was very stupid of me, I... I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted him to get something for you, didn't you? Yes. I wanted to get you a present for your birthday. 
Why should you have asked him? I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and you know how ignorant I am. Bertie Cameron had a brand new gun he wanted to sell. I went into Singapore on the night of Hammond's death to buy it. Why should you want to make me a present of another? How should I know that you were going to buy a gun? Because I told you. I'd forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking to me like this? Crosby to Joyce. Wasn't it a criminal offense that you committed in buying that letter? It's not the sort of thing that a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense? I've been trying to keep the fact out of my mind. But if you insist on a straight answer, I'm afraid I must admit it was. Then why did you do it? You! You of all people! What were you trying to save me from? Well, I've told you. I felt that... No, you haven't. Come, come, Bob. Don't be a fool. I don't know what you mean. Juries are very stupid, and you don't want to let them get any silly ideas in their heads. Who has the letter now? Have you got it? Yes. Where is it? Why do you want to know? God damn it! I want to see it! I've got no right to show it you. Is it your money you bought it with, or mine? I've got to pay ten thousand dollars for that letter, and by God I'm going to see it. At least I'd like to know that I've had my money's worth. Let him see it. Without a word, Joyce takes his pocketbook from his pocket and takes out the letter. He hands it to Crosby. He reads it. What does it mean? It means that Jeff Hammond was my lover. Crosby covering his face with his hands. No, no, no. Why did you kill him? He'd been my lover for years. It's not true. For years. And then he changed. I didn't know what was the matter. I couldn't believe that he didn't care for me any more. I loved him. I didn't want to love him. I couldn't help myself. I hated myself for loving him, and yet he was everything in the world to me. He was all my life. And then I heard he was living with a Chinese woman. I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her with my own eyes, walking in the village, with her gold bracelets and her necklaces. A Chinese woman. Horrible. They all knew in the compong that she was his mistress. And when I passed her, she looked at me, and I saw that she knew I was his mistress, too. I sent for him. The stage darkens for a moment. When the lights go up again, Leslie, wearing the dress she wore in the first act, is seen seated at the table, working at her lace. Geoffrey Hammond comes in. He is a good-looking fellow in the late thirties, with a breezy manner and abundant self-confidence. Jeff, I thought you were never coming. What's that bald, bad husband of yours gone to Singapore for? He's gone to buy a gun that Bertie Cameron wants to sell. I suppose he wants to bag that tiger the natives are talking about. I bet I get him first. What about a little drink? Help yourself. He goes to a table and pours himself out a whiskey and soda. I say, is anything the matter? That note of yours was rather hectic. What have you done with it? I tore it up at once. What do you take me for? Jeff, I can't go on like this any more. I'm at the end of my tether. Why? What's up? Oh, don't pretend. What's the good of that? Why have you left me all this time without a sign? I've had an awful lot to do. You haven't had so much to do that you couldn't spare a few minutes to write me. There didn't seem to be any object in taking useless risks. If we don't want to bust up, we must take certain elementary precautions. We've been very lucky so far. It would be silly to make a mess of things now. Don't treat me like a perfect fool. I say, Leslie, darling, if you send for me just to make a scene, I'm going to take myself off. I'm sick of these eternal rows. A scene? Don't you know how I love you? Well, darling, you've got a damn funny way of showing it. 
You drive me to desperation. He looks at her for a moment reflectively, then, with his hands in his pockets, goes up to her with deliberation. Leslie, I wonder if you've noticed that we hardly ever meet now without having a row. Is it my fault? I don't say that. I dare say it's mine. But when that happens with two people who are on the sort of terms that we are, it looks very much as though things were wearing a bit thin. What do you mean by that? Well, when that happens, I'm not sure if the common sense thing is not to say. We've had a ripping time, but all good things must come to an end, and the best thing we can do is to make a break while we've still got the chance of keeping friends. Jeff? I'm all for facing facts. Facts? What is that China woman doing in your house? My dear, what are you talking about? Do you think I don't know that you've been living with a China woman for months? Nonsense. What sort of a fool do you take me for? Why, it's the common gossip of the Kampong. Hammond with a shrug of the shoulders. My dear, if you're going to listen to the gossip of the natives... Then what is she doing in your bungalow? I didn't know there was a China woman about. I don't bother much about what goes out in my servants' quarters as long as they do their work properly. What does that mean? Well, I shouldn't be surprised if one of the boys had got a girl there. What do I care as long as she keeps out of my way? I've seen her. What is she like? Old and fat. You're not paying me a very pretty compliment. My head boy's old and fat, too. Your head boy isn't going to dress a woman in silk at five dollars a yard. She had a couple of hundred pounds worth of jewelry on her. It sounds as though she were of a thrifty disposition. Perhaps she thinks that the best way to invest her savings. Will you swear she's not your mistress? Certainly. On your honor? On my honor. It's a lie. All right, then, it's a lie. But in that case, why won't you let me go? Because in spite of everything, I love you with all my heart. I can't let you go now. You're all I have in the world. If you have no love for me, have pity on me. Without you, I'm lost. Oh, Jeff, I love you. No one will ever love you as I've loved you. I know that often I've been beastly to you and horrible, but I've been so unhappy. My dear, I don't want to make you unhappy, but it's no good beating about the bush. The thing's over and done with. You must let me go now. You really must. Oh, no, Jeff. You don't mean that. You can't mean that. Leslie, dear, I'm terribly sorry, but the facts are there and you've got to face them. This is the end and you've got to make the best of it. I've made up my mind and there it is. How cruel. How monstrously cruel. You wouldn't treat a dog as you're treating me. Is it my fault if I don't love you? Damn it all, one either loves or one doesn't. Oh, you're of stone. I'd do anything in the world for you, and you won't give me a chance. Oh, my God, why can't you be reasonable? I tell you I'm sick and tired of the whole thing. Do you want me to tell you in so many words that you mean nothing to me? Don't you know that? Haven't you felt it? You must be blind. Yes, I've known it only too well, and I felt it. I didn't care. It's not love anymore that seethes in my heart. It's madness. It's torture to see you, but it's torture ten times worse not to see you. If you leave me now, I'll kill myself. She picks up the revolver that is lying on the table. I swear to God I'll kill myself. Oh, don't talk such damned rot. Don't you think I mean it? Don't you think I have the courage? I have no patience with you. You're enough to drive anyone out of his senses. If you'd got sick of me, would you have hesitated to send me about my business? Not for a minute. Do you think I don't know women? You've ruined my life. And now you're tired of me? You want to cast me aside like a worn-out coat? No, no, no. You can do what you like and say what you like. But I tell you, it's finished. I'll never let you go. Never. Never. She flings her arms round his neck, but he releases himself roughly. 
The touch of her exasperates him. I'm fed up, fed up. I'm sick of the sight of you. No, no, no. If you want the truth, you must have it. Yes, the China woman is my mistress, and I don't care who knows it. If you ask me to choose between you and her, I choose her, every time. And now, for God's sake, leave me alone. You cur. She seizes the revolver and fires at him. He staggers and falls. The lights go out, and the stage is once more in darkness. I ran after him and fired again. He fell, and then I stood over him, and I fired and fired till there were no more cartridges. The lights go up. Crosby and Joyce are listening to Leslie's story. She is dressed as at the beginning of the scene. Have I deserved this of you, Leslie? No, I have no excuses to offer for myself. I betrayed you. What do you want to do now? It is for you to say. How could you, Leslie? The awful part is that notwithstanding everything, I love you still. Oh, God, how you must despise me. I despise myself. Leslie shakes her head slowly. I don't know what I've done to deserve your love. Oh, if only I could blame anybody but myself. I can't. I deserve everything I have to suffer. Oh, Robert, my dear. He turns aside and buries his head in his hands. Oh, what shall I do? It's all gone. All gone. Oh, 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 oh. He begins to sob with the great, painful, difficult sobs of a man unused to tears. She sinks on her knees beside him. Oh, don't cry, my dear, my dear. He springs up and pushes her on one side. I'm a fool. There's no need for me to make an exhibition of myself. I'm sorry. He goes hastily out of the room. Leslie rises to her feet. No, uh, don't go to him. Give him a moment to get hold of himself. I'm so dreadfully sorry for him. He's going to forgive you. He can't do without you. If he'd only give me another chance. Don't you love him at all? No. I wish to God I did. Then what's to be done? I swear to you that I'll do everything in the world to make him happy. I'll make amends. I'll oblige him to forget. He shall never know that I don't love him as he wants to be loved. It's not easy to live with a man you don't love. But you've had the courage and the strength to do evil. Perhaps you will have the courage and the strength to do good. That will be your retribution. No, that won't be my retribution. I can do that and do it. Gladly. He's so kind and good. My retribution is greater. With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. End of Act Three, as premiered in London. End of The Letter, a play in three acts by W. Somerset Maugham. Act Three of The Letter, a play in three acts, as opened on Broadway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Letter, a play in three acts, by W. Somerset Maugham. Act Three. Scene One. The scene is a small room in the Chinese quarter of Singapore. The walls are whitewashed, but dirty and bedraggled. On one of them hangs a cheap Chinese oleograph, stained and discolored. On another, unframed and pinned up, a picture of a nude from one of the illustrated papers. The only furniture consists of a sandalwood box and a low Chinese pallet bed with a lacquered neck rest. There is a closed window, which is at the back, and a door on the right. 
It is night, and the room is lit by one electric light, a globe without a shade. When the curtain rises, Chung Hee is lying on the pallet bed with his opium pipe, his lamp, and the tray on which are the little tin of opium and a couple of long needles. He is reading a Chinese paper. He is a fat Chinaman in white trousers and a singlet. On his feet are Chinese slippers. A boy, dressed in the same way, is seated on the sandalwood chest, idly playing a Chinese flute. He plays a strange Chinese tune. Chung He dips his needle in the opium and heats it over the flame of the lamp, puts it in the pipe, inhales and presently blows out a thick cloud of smoke. There is a scratching at the door. Chung He speaks a few words in Chinese and the boy goes to it and just opens it. The boy speaks to the person there and still from the door says something to Chung He. Chung He makes answer and gets up from the pallet bed, putting his opium things aside. The door is opened wider, and Ong Chi Sang comes in. This way, sir, please. Come in. Joyce enters wearing his toppy. I nearly broke my neck on those stairs. This is my friend, sir. Does he speak English? Ah, uh, yes. My speak is very good. How are do you do, sir? I uh, hope you are quite well. Please do come in. Good evening. Uh, I say, the air in here is awful. Couldn't we have the window open? I dare very bad, sir. You may bring thief air. We'll risk it. Very good, sir. I will open the window. He goes to it and does so, Joyce taking off his toppy and putting it down. I see you've been smoking. Uh, yes, my chauffeur very bad for my belly. Smoky do for we pipers make it more bad hair. We'd better get to our business. Yes, sir. Business is business, as we say. What is your friend's name, Ong? I call we all shame Shungati. You know she him white and on chop. Shungati, Janawala Tila. I suppose you know what I've come for? I am sure. My fairy clan do see you in my house. My give you my business card. I oh, yes. I don't think I need it. Ah, sure, you very good, China D. Ho shame, Zhu Chang. Number one, Gua D. My can show more cheap than you buy. Yat Shadows. I don't want any tea. My show you Zua Dio Shuka. Very best, Gua D. No can get more bad hair in China. Make fairy good as us. I show you cheaper. I don't want any silk. Fairy well, you take my business card. Shungati, Janawala Tiwa, Du Shiksa Fawa, Victoria Stoita. My happy you want some tomorrow or next day. Have you got this letter? Shiny Schumann half a cut. Where is she? She come pleasantly. Why the devil isn't she here? She here all night. She come pleasantly. She where do you come? She? More better you tell her to come, I think. Yes, I tell her come this minute. He speaks to the boy in Chinese, who gives a guttural, monosyllabic reply and goes out. To Joyce. You sit down, I guess. I prefer to stand. Chung He handing him a green tin of cigarettes. You smoke it. She go wet. Very good. She go wet. Oh, shame. For we got shorts. I don't want to smoke. Chung He to Joyce. You want she buy China D. Very cheap. Number one, Kwa D. Get a hell. 
Oh, I don't. I am no shopee. Maybe you like a swap of silk. No, you want to jib jib half cut. Stewing number one dollar D. I show you one thousand dollars. Very nice of present you are missus. Go to hell. Oh, I don't. My smoky cigarette. The door is opened and the boy comes in again with a tray on which are bowls of tea. He takes it to Joyce, who shakes his head and turns away. The others help themselves. Why the devil doesn't this woman come? I think she come now, sir. There is a scratching at the door. I'm curious to see her. My friends say that poor Mr. Hammond, deceased, was completely under her thumb, sir. She no speak English. She speak my way under Chinese. Meanwhile, the boy has gone to the door and opened it. The Chinese woman comes in. She wears a silk sarong and a long muslin coat over a blouse. On her arms are heavy gold bangles. She wears a gold chain round her neck and gold pins in her shining black hair. Her cheeks and mouth are painted, and she is heavily powdered. Arched eyebrows make a thin, dark line over her eyes. She comes in and walks slowly to the pallet bed and sits on the edge of it with her legs dangling. Hong Chi Seng makes an observation to her in Chinese, and she briefly answers. She takes no notice of the white man. Has she got the letter? Yes, sir. Where is it? She's a very ignorant woman, sir. I think she wants to see the money before she gives the letter. Very well. The Chinese woman takes a cigarette from the tin and lights it. She appears to take no notice of what is proceeding. Joyce counts out the ten thousand dollars and hands them to Ong Chi Seng. Ong Chi Seng counts them for himself, while Chung He watches him. They are all grave, businesslike, and the Chinese are oddly unconcerned. The sum is quite collect, sir. The Chinese woman takes the letter from her tunic and hands it to Ong Chi Seng. Ong Chi Seng gives it a glance. This is the light document, sir. He hands it to Joyce, who reads it silently. There's not very much for the money. I am sure that you will not regret it, sir. Considering all the circumstances, it is what you call dirt cheap. I know that you have too great a regard for me to allow me to pay more for an article than the market price. Shall you want me for anything else tonight, please, sir? I don't think so. In that case, sir, if it is convenient, I will stay here and talk to my friend. I suppose you want to divide the swag. I am sorry, sir, that that is a word I have not come across in my studies. You'd better look it out in the dictionary. Yes, sir. I will do it without delay. I've been wondering how much you were going to get out of this, Ong Chi Seng. The laborer is worthy of his hire, as our Lord said, sir. I didn't know you were a Christian, Ong. I am not, sir, to the best of my belief. In that case, he certainly isn't your Lord. I was only making use of the common English idiom, sir. In point of fact, I am a disciple of the late Herbert Spencer. I have also been much influenced by Nietzsche, Shaw, and Herbert G. Wells. It is no wonder that I am no match for you. As he goes out, the curtain falls quickly. Scene 2 the scene is the same as in Act I, the sitting room at the Crosby's bungalow. It is about five o'clock in the afternoon, and the light is soft and mellow. When the curtain rises, the stage is empty, but immediately the sound is heard of a car stopping, and Mrs. Joyce and Withers come up the steps of the veranda and enter the room. 
They are followed in an instant by the head boy and another Chinese servant, one with a suitcase and the other with a large basket. Mrs. Joyce is a buxom, florid, handsome woman of about forty. Good gracious, how desolate the place looks. You can see in the twinkling of an eye that there hasn't been a woman here to look after things. I must say it does look a bit dreary. I knew it. I felt it in my bones. That's why I wanted to get here before Leslie. I thought we might have a chance to do a little something before she came. She goes over to the piano, opens it, and puts a piece of music on the stand. A few flowers would help. I wonder if these wretched boys will have had the sense to pick some. To the head boy who bears the basket. Is the ice all right, boy? Yeah, Missy. Well, put it in some place where it won't melt. Are there any flowers? My hooky see. Mrs. Joyce to the other boy. Oh, that's my bag. Put it in the spare room. The two servants go out. You know, I can't help wondering how Mrs. Crosby can bring herself to come back here. My poor friend, the Crosbys haven't got half a dozen houses to choose from. When you've only one house, I suppose you've got to live in it no matter what's happened. At all events, I should have liked to wait a bit. I wanted her to. I'd made all my plans for them both to come back to my house after the trial. I wanted them to stay with me till they were able to get away for a holiday. I should have thought that much the most sensible thing to do. But they wouldn't. Bob said he couldn't leave the estate, and Leslie said she couldn't leave Bob. So then I said Howard and I would come down here. I thought it would be easier for them if they had someone with them for a day or two. Withers with a smile. And I think you were determined not to be robbed of your celebration? You don't know my million-dollar cocktails, do you? They're celebrated all through the FMS. When Leslie was arrested, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another until she was acquitted. I've been waiting for this day, and no one is going to deprive me of my treat. Hence the ice, I suppose. Hence the ice, wise young man. As soon as the others come, I'll start making them. With your own hands? With my own hands, I don't mind telling you I never knew anyone who could make a better cocktail than I can. Withers with a grin. We all think the cocktails we make ourselves better than anybody else's, you know. Yes, but you're all lamentably mistaken, and I happen to be right. Uh, the ways of providence are dark. The two boys come in with bowls of flowers. They place them here and there so that the room looks exactly as it did during the first act. Oh, good. That makes the room look much more habitable. They ought to be here in a minute. We went very fast, you know, and I dare say a good many people wanted to say a word or two to Leslie. I don't suppose they were able to get away as quickly as they expected. The boys go out. I'll wait till they come, shall I? Of course, you must wait. I thought the Attorney General was very decent. I knew he would be. I know his wife, you know. She said she thought Leslie should never be tried at all. But of course, men are so funny. I shall never forget the shout that went up when the jury came in and said, not guilty. It was thrilling, wasn't it? And Leslie absolutely impassive, sitting there as though it had nothing to do with her. I can't get over the way she gave her evidence. By George, she's a marvel. It was beautiful. I couldn't help crying. It was so modest and so restrained. Howard, who thinks me very hysterical and impulsive, told me the other day he'd never known a woman who had so much self-control as Leslie. And that's real praise, because I don't think he very much likes her. Why not? Oh, you know what men are. They never care very much for the women their particular friends marry. The head boy comes in with a pillow covered by a cloth. Hello, what's this? Missy Pillow Lace. Mrs. Joyce going to it and taking the cloth off. 
Oh, did you bring that? I thought maybe Missy wants you. He puts it down on the table on which it stood in the first act. I'm sure she will. That was very thoughtful of you, boy. To withers as the boy goes out. <laughs> you know, sometimes you could kill these Chinese boys, and then all of a sudden they'll do things that are so kind and so considerate that you forgive them everything. Withers looking at the lace. By George, it is beautiful, isn't it? You know, it's just the sort of thing you'd expect her to do. Mr. Withers, I want to ask you something rather horrible. When you came that night, where exactly was Jeff Hammond's body lying? Out on the veranda, just under that lamp. My God, it gave me a turn when I ran up the steps and nearly fell over him. Has it occurred to you that every time Leslie comes into the house, she'll have to step over the place where the body lay? It's rather grim. Perhaps it won't strike her. Fortunately, she's not the sort of hysterical fool that I am, but I, oh dear, I could never sleep again. There is the sound of a car driving up. There they are. They haven't been so long, after all. Mrs. Joyce going over to the veranda. No, they must have started within ten minutes of us. Leslie, Leslie! Leslie comes in, followed by Crosby and Joyce. Crosby is wearing a neat suit of ducks. Leslie wears a silk wrap and a hat. You haven't been here long, have you? Mrs. Joyce, taking her in her arms. Welcome, welcome back to your home. Leslie releasing herself. Darling. She looks round. How nice and cozy it looks. I can hardly realize that I've ever been away. Are you tired? Would you like to go and lie down? Tired? Why, I've been doing nothing but rest for the last six weeks. Oh, Bob, aren't you happy to have her back again? Now, Dorothy, don't gush. If you must gush, gush over me. I'm not going to gush over you, you old brute. What have you done? Leslie holding out her hand to him with a charming smile. He's done everything. I can never thank him enough. You don't know what he's been to me through all this dreary time of waiting. I don't mind confessing that I thought you made rather a good speech, Howard. Well, thank you for those kind words. I think perhaps you might have been a little more impassioned without hurting yourself. I don't agree with you, Mrs. Joyce. It's just because it was so cold and measured and businesslike that it was so effective. Well, let's have this drink you've been talking about, Dorothy. Come and help me, Mr. Withers. When I make a cocktail, I want a great many assistants. Leslie taking off her hat. I know what an elaborate business your million-dollar cocktail is, Dorothy. Mrs. Joyce says she goes out with Withers. Don't be impatient. I can't hurry it. I must take my time. I'll go and tidy myself up. You don't need it. You look as if you just come out of a bandbox. I shan't be a minute. There's something I particularly want to say to you. I'll make myself scarce. No, I want you, old man. I want your legal opinion. No, do you? Fire away. Well, look here. I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. I think a bit of a holiday would do you both good. Could you get away, Robert? Even if it's only for two or three weeks, I'd be thankful. What's the use of two or three weeks? We must get away for good. But how can we? You can't very well throw off a job like this. You'd never get such a good one again, you know. That's where you're wrong. I've got something in view that's much better. We can neither of us live here. It would be impossible. We've gone through too much in this bungalow. How can we ever forget? Leslie with a shudder. No, don't, Bob. Don't. Crosby to Joyce. You see, heaven knows Leslie has nerves of iron, but there's a limit to human endurance. You know how lonely the life is. I should never have a moment's peace when I was out and thought of her sitting in this room by herself. It's out of the question. 
Oh, don't think of me, Bob. You've made this estate. It was nothing when you came here. Why, it's like your child. It's the apple of your eye. I hate it now. I hate every tree on it. I must get away, and so must you. You don't want to stay. It's all been so miserable. I don't want to make any more difficulties. I know our only chance of peace is to get someplace where we can forget. But could you get another job? Yes, that's just it. Something suddenly cropped up. That's why I wanted to talk to you about it at once. It's in Sumatra. We'd be right away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life with new friends. The only thing is that you'd be awfully lonely, darling. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'm used to loneliness. I'd be glad to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead, and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? I hope it'll be better. At all events, I shall be working for myself and not for a rotten company in London. Joy startled. What do you mean by that? You're not buying an estate. Yes, I am. Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? It's a chance in a thousand. It belongs to a Malacca Chinaman who's in financial difficulties and is willing to let it go for thirty thousand dollars if we can have the money the day after tomorrow. But how are you going to raise thirty thousand dollars? Well, I've saved about ten thousand since I've been in the East, and Charlie Meadows is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Leslie and Joyce exchange a glance of consternation. It seems rather rash to put all your eggs in one basket. I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account, Robert. You needn't worry about me, really. I shall settle down here quite comfortably. Don't talk nonsense, darling. It's only a moment ago that you said you'd give anything to clear out. I spoke without thinking. I believe it would be a mistake to run away. The sensible thing to do is to sit tight. Everybody's been so kind. There's no reason to suppose they're not going to continue. I'm sure all our friends will do all they can to make things easy for us. You know, dear, you mustn't be frightened of a little risk. It's only if one takes risks that one can make big money. These Chinese estates are never any good. You know how haphazard and careless the Chinese are. This is not that sort of thing at all. It belongs to a very progressive Chinaman, and he's had a European manager. It's not a leap in the dark. It's a thoroughly sound proposition, and I reckon that in ten years I can make enough money to allow us to retire. Then we'll settle down in England and live like lords. Honestly, Robert, I'd prefer to stay here. I'm attached to the place, and when I've had time to forget all that has happened... How can you forget? Anyhow, it's not a thing that you must enter into without due consideration. You'd naturally want to go over to Sumatra and look for yourself. That's just it. I've got to make up my mind at once. The offer only holds for 36 hours. But, my dear fellow, you can't pay $30,000 for an estate without proper investigation. None of you planters are any too businesslike. But really, there are limits. Don't try to make me out a bigger fool than I am. I had it examined, and it's worth 50000 if it's worth a dollar. I've got all the papers in my office. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Oh, come, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. Darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I want to go, too. I can't stay here any more. Oh, why are you so obstinate? Come, come, dear, don't be unreasonable. Let me go and get the papers. I shan't be a minute. He goes out. There is a moment's silence. Leslie looks at Joyce with terrified appeal. He makes a despairing gesture. I had to pay ten thousand dollars for the letter. What are you going to do? Joyce miserably. What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. Give me a little time. 
I'm at the end of my strength. I can't bear anything more. You heard what he said. He wants the money at once to buy this estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Give me a little time. I can't afford to give you a sum like that. No, I don't expect you to. Perhaps I can get it somehow. How? You know it's impossible. It's money I put by for the education of my boys. I was glad to advance it, and I wouldn't have minded waiting a few weeks. If you'd only give me a month, I'd have time to think of something. I could prepare Robert and explain to him by degrees. I'd watch for my opportunity. If he buys this estate, the money will be gone. No, no, no. I can't let him do that. I don't want to be unkind to you, but I can't lose my money. Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, what shall I do? I'm dreadfully sorry for you. Oh, don't be sorry for me. I don't matter. It's Robert. It'll break his heart. If there were only some other way. I don't know what to do. I suppose you're right. There's only one thing to do. Tell him. Tell him and have done with it. I'm broken. Crosby comes in again with a bundle of papers in his hand and two large photographs. Of course, if it hadn't been for Leslie, I should have run over to Sumatra last week. I'd just like you to have a look first at the report I've had. Look here, Bob. Has it struck you that your costs over this affair will be pretty heavy? I know all you lawyers are robbers. I dare say this will leave me a little short of ready money, but I don't suppose you'd mind if I keep you waiting till I've had time to settle down. You know I can be trusted, and if you like, I'll pay you interest. I don't think you have any idea how large the sum is. Of course, we don't want to press you, but we can't be out of our money indefinitely. I think I should warn you that when you've settled with us, you won't have much money left over to embark in rather hazardous speculations. You're putting the fear of God into me. How much will the costs come to? I'm not going to charge you anything for my personal services. Whatever I've done has been done out of pure friendship. But there are certain out-of-pocket expenses that I'm afraid you must pay. Of course, it's awfully good of you not to wish to charge me for anything else. I hardly like to accept. What do the out-of-pocket expenses amount to? You remember that I told you yesterday that there was a letter of Leslie's that I thought we ought to get hold of? Yes, I really didn't think it mattered very much, but of course I put myself in your hands. I thought you were making a great deal out of something that wasn't very important. You told me to do what I thought fit, and I bought the letter from the person in whose possession it was. I had to pay a great deal of money for it. What a bore. Still, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? I'm afraid I had to pay ten thousand dollars for it. Ten thousand dollars? Why, that's a fortune. I thought you were going to say a couple of hundred. You must have been mad. You may be quite sure that I wouldn't have given it if I could have got it for less. But that's everything I have in the world. It reduces me to beggary. Not that exactly. But you must understand that you haven't got money to buy an estate with. But why didn't you let them bring the letter in and tell them to do what they damned well liked? I didn't dare. Do you mean to say it was absolutely necessary to suppress the letter? If you wanted your wife acquitted. But, but, I don't understand. They're not going to tell me that they could have brought in a verdict of guilty. They couldn't have hanged her for putting a noxious vermin out of the way. Of course they wouldn't have hanged her. They might have found her guilty of manslaughter. I dare say she'd have got off with two or three years. Three years? My Leslie! My little Leslie, it would have killed her! But what was there in the letter? I told you yesterday. It was very stupid of me, I... I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted him to get something for you, didn't you? Yes. I wanted to get you a present for your birthday. Why should you have asked him? I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and you know how ignorant I am. 
Bertie Cameron had a brand new gun he wanted to sell. I went into Singapore on the night of Hammond's death to buy it. Why should you want to make me a present of another? How should I know that you were going to buy a gun? Because I told you. I'd forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking to me like this? Crosby to Joyce. Wasn't it a criminal offense that you committed in buying that letter? It's not the sort of thing that a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense? I've been trying to keep the fact out of my mind. But if you insist on a straight answer, I'm afraid I must admit it was. Then why did you do it? You! You of all people! What were you trying to save me from? Well, I've told you. I felt that... No, you haven't. Come, come, Bob. Don't be a fool. I don't know what you mean. Juries are very stupid, and you don't want to let them get any silly ideas in their heads. Who has the letter now? Have you got it? Yes. Where is it? Why do you want to know? God damn it! I want to see it! I've got no right to show it you. Is it your money you bought it with, or mine? I've got to pay ten thousand dollars for that letter, and by God I'm going to see it. At least I'd like to know that I've had my money's worth. Let him see it. Without a word, Joyce takes his pocketbook from his pocket and takes out the letter. He hands it to Crosby. He reads it. What does it mean? It means that Jeff Hammond was my lover. Crosby covering his face with his hands. No, no, no. Why did you kill him? He'd been my lover for years. He'd become my lover almost immediately after he came back from the war. It's not true. I used to drive out to a place we knew, and he met me two or three times a week. And when Robert went to Singapore, he used to come to the bungalow late when the boys had gone for the night. We saw one another constantly, all the time. I trusted you. I loved you. And then lately, a year ago, he began to change. I didn't know what was the matter. I couldn't believe that he didn't care for me any more. I was frantic. Oh, if you knew what agonies I endured. I passed through hell. I knew he didn't want me any more, and I wouldn't let him go. Sometimes I thought he hated me. Misery. Misery. I loved him. I didn't want to love him. I couldn't help myself. I hated myself for loving him. And yet he was everything in the world to me. He was all my life. Oh, God. Oh, God. And then I heard he was living with a Chinese woman. I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her with my own eyes, walking in the village with her gold bracelets and her necklaces. A Chinese woman. Horrible. They all knew in the Kampong that she was his mistress. And when I passed her, she looked at me, and I saw that she knew I was his mistress too. Oh, the shame. I sent for him. I told him I must see him. You've read the letter. I was mad to write it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. It was a lifetime. And when last we'd parted, he held me in his arms and kissed me and told me not to worry. And he went straight from my arms to hers. He was a rotter. He always was. That letter. We'd always been so careful. He always tore up any word I wrote to him the moment he'd read it. How was I to know he'd leave that one? That doesn't matter now. He came, and I told him I knew about the China woman. He denied it. He said it was only scandal. I was beside myself. I don't know what I said to him. Oh, I hated him then. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I tore him limb from limb. I said everything I could to wound him. I insulted him. I could have spat in his face. And at last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me, 
and never wanted to see me again. He said I bored him to death. And then he acknowledged that it was true about the China woman. He said he'd known her for years, and she was the only woman who really meant anything to him, and the rest was just pastime. And he said he was glad I knew, and now at last I'd leave him alone. He said things to me that I thought it impossible a man ever to say to a woman. He couldn't have been more vile if I'd been a harlot on the streets. And then, I don't know what happened. I was beside myself. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry and I saw I'd hit him. He staggered and rushed for the veranda. I ran after him and fired again. He fell and then I stood over him. And I fired and fired till there were no more cartridges. There is a pause and then Osby goes up to her. Have I deserved this of you, Leslie? No. I've been vile. I have no excuses to offer for myself. I betrayed you. What do you want to do now? It is for you to say. It was for your sake I wanted to go away. I only saved that money for you. I shall have to stay here now. But I could manage to give you enough to live on in England. Where am I to go? I have no family left and no friends. I'm quite alone in the world. Oh, I'm so unhappy. How could you, Leslie? What did I do wrong that I couldn't win your love? What can I say? It wasn't me that deceived you. It wasn't me that loved that other. It was a madness that seized me. And I was as little my own mistress as though I were delirious with fever. It brought me no happiness, that love. It only brought me shame and remorse. The awful part is that notwithstanding everything, I love you still. Oh, God, how you must despise me. I despise myself. Leslie shakes her head slowly. I don't know what I've done to deserve your love. I'm worthless. Oh, if only I could blame anybody but myself. I can't. I deserve everything I have to suffer. Oh, Robert, my dear. He turns aside and buries his head in his hands. Oh, what shall I do? It's all gone. All gone. Oh, 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 oh. He begins to sob with the great, painful, difficult sobs of a man unused to tears. She sinks on her knees beside him. Oh, don't cry, darling. Darling. He springs up and pushes her on one side. I'm a fool. There's no need for me to make an exhibition of myself. I'm sorry. He goes hastily out of the room. Leslie rises to her feet. Don't go to him. Give him a moment to get hold of himself. I'm so dreadfully sorry for him. He's going to forgive you. He can't do without you. If he'd only give me another chance. Don't you love him at all? No. I wish to God I did. Then what's to be done? I'll give my life such as it is to him... To him only. I swear to you that I'll do everything in the world to make him happy. I'll make amends. I'll oblige him to forget. He shall never know that I don't love him as he wants to be loved. It's not easy to live with a man you don't love. But you've had the courage and the strength to do evil. Perhaps you will have the courage and the strength to do good. That will be your retribution. No. That won't be my retribution. I can do that and do it gladly. He's so kind. He's so tender. My retribution is greater. With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. End of Act Three as opened on Broadway End of The Letter A Play in Three Acts by W. Somerset Maugham.